Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Ender, president of Grand Rapids Community College, and it is our pleasure to be able to host uh, the event today. I've, I have some board members in the room that have joined me, and if they could just briefly stand when I recognize them. Ellen James, I know, is here. Terry Hanlon, Rick Verberg, please. On behalf of our board and these three board members, uh, let us welcome you to our DeVos campus of Grand Rapids Community College. When President Austin called and asked if we would host this event, I quite frankly jumped at the opportunity because this is what a community college is all about. It's about bringing people from the community to, together to talk about, to debate, to reason, uh, to figure out a better way for all of us. And I, I think in education, uh, we're at that point. Uh, tremendous pressures facing education, all levels. Uh, whether they be budget pressures or more pressures for accountability or just the pressure to get people involved in the learning process because that's so critical for the future of the state and country. So for us to be here is, is, and to have this event here is really important and I appreciate everyone attending. I think we start today with President John Austin who is President of the State Board of Education who in effect will be our host. John? Thank you, thank you, Steve. We'll, we'll take applause at any time we can get it, but it's unnecessary. We're, we're here because we work for you, and, and I am John Austin, president of the Michigan State Board. I am going to be joined uh, soon, I trust. Uh, Kathy Strauss, uh, former president, board member, and Marianne McGuire are on their way. I think several thunderstorms uh, uh, you hit uh, today coming from the Detroit area. So we will have three of our eight members here, and uh, we very much uh, appreciate those of you who have come and those of others who are going to be joining us, I'm sure, over the course of the next few hours. And I really want to thank Steve Ender and the Grand Rapids Community College team, um, uh, including uh, Catherine Mullins. Kathy, are you here? Who just made it so easy when, when we said, is there a neutral ground in education where we can convene and come as a state board to listen to concerns, issues, challenges, but also I think what we're going to hear uh, also today are some of the ways educators are solving problems in spite of and in the face of tremendous uh, budget challenges, tremendous pressures uh, on education. I, you know, it's, it's, the good news is that everybody cares about uh, helping improve education. That's also the bad news is everybody is in the business of helping you improve education from the state board, the governor, the, the business community. So let's take that uh, glass half full approach that we all know this is so, so important to our economy to help more of our people, adults and young people get uh, the kind of education that helps them be creative, helps them be entrepreneurs, helps them find a place and create uh, their own living in today's economy. Uh, and the State Board of Education is um, thankful that uh, we have a chance to come and, and listen. We want to um, learn about uh, what you in the trenches are seeing, experiencing, uh, flag issues, because we as a state board are complicit uh, in making big decisions about education. I'm going to review very briefly our role just in a couple minutes to um, sort of share the world from our point of view. Uh, we have, we want to do our job well, we want to make good decisions as we uh, add to the expectations of what our education system needs to be. So we're mainly here to listen, learn, and understand better your perspective, your challenges, and your innovations. Uh, we, we also are uh, very uh, happy to have many of your education leaders uh, from all levels here. Challenges and your innovations. Uh, we, we also are uh, very uh, happy to have many of your education leaders uh, from all levels here today who can share perspective and share recommendations and share innovations. Um, housekeeping real quick, what we're going to do first is after a brief overview on the State Board, and, and that's fine, my colleagues will be here by that time and they know what our job is. I uh, am going to invite um, six or eight uh, education stakeholder leaders to give very brief presentations on their uh, Moment, issue of the moment, their overview for what's important to worry about and do in education, their recommendations to us, and in many cases their innovative program or initiative that in part these forums as we move around the state can shine a spotlight on 
our challenges and our issues and help us get better educated and learn uh, what's going on, but also to shine a spotlight on uh, effective efforts that stakeholders in the community uh, are moving that can help us lift educational outcomes for all our young people. Uh, if you would like to speak, then we'll have public participation for however many and whoever wants to talk. Again, we ask that you limit it to three to five minutes. Uh, if you'd like to submit written comments, please do so. If you'd like to speak, uh, fill out a form. We've got them on the table and in the back, and we'll grab those after our invited presenters and go through them uh, in the order that we've got them and, and make sure everybody has a chance to speak and give voice to what's on their mind about this important topic of our education and our children. So the state board role. We're, whether you knew what you were doing or not, you elected eight of us uh, to be the governing body for education policy. The Constitution invests us with leadership and supervision over all education, in, including higher education, though we have trustees and university boards and regents who uh, have that direct responsibility as well. But we're trying to think broadly about what's the education system we need in Michigan, pre-K, prenatal, through higher ed, as we look at our work. Uh, we are uh, required, as we have been doing, to make recommendations to the legislature and the governor on what the education system needs to look like and what the financial requirements are. Uh, we appoint and hire the state superintendent of public instruction, who is the day-to-day -day head of the Michigan Department of Education. Our recent actions over the last few years, I think we uh, have been in the center of the move to uh, increase uh, standards and high expectations in all content levels, first K-8, and then we added the high school uh, content expectations, the Michigan Merit Curriculum. We have also endorsed uh, revising those, hopefully for the last time in a long time, so that they are centered on the national um, convergence around what are the standards of learning and key disciplines that every young person needs to be able to step into this community college or university or work without needing remedial work. And so those college and career ready standards we have embraced, we've been making some headway and we want to do more in preparing and supporting better our teachers and our administrators to be able to deliver on those high content learning standards. Uh, we are revising again as we speak, but we want to get to the finish of having a good state accreditation system that says here's how schools are performing and which schools are not performing over time. Uh, on most cylinders so that we can put a spotlight on those schools that are most in need of our turnaround support and help. Uh, we have embraced universal education for all young people, uh, whatever their special needs and abilities, and that's a key principle and cornerstone of our system. We have been very uh, strong over the years in saying each district should have an anti-bullying policy. We have a state model policy. It's not required. Uh, as I mentioned, we certainly feel we would benefit as a state from a strong state uh, bullying legislation to put some strength and, and teeth into that topic. And we have, among other policies, some of the best with educators' help uh, and communities' help, school health, nutrition, and other policies that we make decisions about. This year, as we have every year, we have made recommendations on what the education system needs to look like and how we need to keep improving and reforming it. Uh, and we made recommendations, and there's a copy on the back table, in February to the governor and the legislature, knowing we had a new governor who signaled he wanted to put an education reform game plan out early in his administration. And we as a bipartisan state board uh, made recommendations that included we want to support and reward student growth and performance. We want to enhance significantly early childhood and better organize it. We want to adopt a... Uh, a simple accreditation system that focuses on underachieving schools. We want to very much increase early college credit taking for all students. Experience in these institutions like community colleges is good, particularly if you're at risk, to get a taste and exposure and experience in those next steps so you know you can do it. Uh, we are eager to enhance virtual learning and blended learning models, uh, and we very much need a comprehensive uh, effort in this state to better prepare, better support when they're new teachers, better reward, and better evaluate and help find satisfying careers in teaching those folks, the teachers, 
with qualified administrators who are the key to delivering the high expectations. So we really feel we need to have a teacher quality offensive and the elements of our recommendations are in the document at, at back. We again called for comprehensive anti-bullying legislation. Uh, on the financing of education, we also said we need to uh, make shared sacrifice, uh, find ways to make changes in legacy systems, healthcare pensions, and shared services but in our view, so that we can do more to invest in early childhood education for all students, so that we can keep K-12 funded adequately to provide services in the classroom and keep great teachers teaching. Uh, we need to provide more funding for higher education so more of our adults and young people can get a high quality post-secondary degree or credential which is essential for success. And we, we definitely wanna provide more operational support for higher education. So those were our financial recommendations. Again, our recommendations to the legislature and the governor uh, were made in February. Uh, there's another, uh, you've seen the governor's education message and part of why we're here uh, is so we can be informed by you about what's important uh, as we make these recommendations and we make policy decisions. Uh, we can reflect together on the governor has made his education reform message. A copy of it is in the back of the room. Uh, there is much where his message and recommendations mirror what we asked him to recommend. There are areas where they don't, but there's much that we can agree on and find common ground and do our job of informing the agenda for the legislature and the governor. But we're here mostly to understand from your perspective what to make of this whole family of education policy that we're trying to advance. I did see out of the corner of my eye my two colleagues, Kathy Strauss and Marian McGuire, who are finding their way into the, the head of the table. So for the rest of this um, morning, or morning, afternoon, I'm going to invite up in turn for brief presentations some of your education uh, leaders and others who have something uh, special they wanna share. But again, we will go back and collect the forms and when we come to public comment, uh, we welcome your participation in public comment as well. So with that, as the host school district, Bernard Taylor, thank you for taking time uh, to share uh, a few minutes on your work and your challenges in Grand Rapids. And please, when you come to speak, if you're comfortable sitting, if you're comfortable using this, whichever way you're comfortable, there's a couple people have presentations. Um, and before, we, Bernard, is, is um, Kimberly Kilby here with the U.S. Department of Education Civil Rights? There's a woman who contacted us, Kimberly Kilby, who's in town with the U.S. Department of Education and Civil Rights who had a survey or some form for parents and community members. She asked if we could make it available here, so I'll wait till she shows and we'll make it available. But Superintendent Taylor, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I know there are other people behind us. I feel like this is like a personal conversation. Um, first of all, welcome to Grand Rapids and welcome to the Grand Rapids Public Schools. Again, I'm superintendent. I've been here since 2006, although it seems like it was just yesterday when I started. And um, in Grand Rapids, we have readily embraced uh, the challenges that are in front of us, uh, both financially and in terms of growing student achievement and over the uh, certainly over the time of my superintendency, I think that we've seen results that come from a narrow focused attention on student achievement and on fiscal responsibility. Uh, we do have a balanced budget. We aim to get one passed by June 30th and we do believe that it will reflect the level of shared sacrifice that is being called for um, at the state level. While we are doing that, we are doing it in a manner that does not, uh, to the degree practicable, um, impact our ability to provide a quality service for our students. And we're going to continue to do that because we enjoy an inordinate level of support from the business, higher education, and philanthropic community. And it's because of those key strategic partnerships that our district is able to weather this financial storm, not in, in a way where we don't have to watch our resources and plan accordingly, because we don't know that our budget challenges are not for 11-12, but 11-12 and 12-13. So we know that even with any new revenues that may come our way, whether they uh, come with um, requirements or not, that we must be prudent, not, over, not just over the course of next year, but the following year. With that said, we are pushing the envelope about reform. Our school board last uh, week passed uh, uh, 
an initiative that will allow us to take uh, responses to uh, creating a district sponsored charter. Now, one provision of that district sponsored charter is that it is tied to legislative reform around teacher tenure in the Public Employee Relations Act. And we believe that if those uh, legislative initiatives come to fruition, it will make it easier for a traditional public school system to work to create choices for parents, to give um, a broader array of opportunities for students, but to do so in a way that accrues benefit to every student in a school district as opposed to creating educational franchises where the benefits accrue to students in that individual educational franchise. We want to make sure that we are growing a system and not necessarily creating franchises. The other issue that we're going to um, attack is one, how we deal with students who quote unquote find themselves in the need of alternative education services. One of the disincentives for a school district like mine is that we serve a significant number of students who, re who are going to need more than four years to graduate from high school, but we all know that school districts are penalized if in fact a student needs more than four years. But what we find is that if we don't deal with that issue, what we do is send students on to community college where they must spend a significant amount of their uh, resources on remedial courses. Well, to me, it makes no sense to ask a student who we can educate until the age of 20 to essentially pay to be remediated when that student could stay within a traditional public school system, receive the remedial services that they need. We can also work to create dual enrollment opportunities for those students so that the resources that they have for post-secondary post education accrue a benefit to them. Now, this is going to require dispensation from the state board in terms of how we look at who is a dropout and the time it takes for those students to, to receive the services that they need. Superintendent Taylor, thank you for your patience. If You might want to replay that bit just um, in a moment now that I've been joined. Marianne McGuire, my colleague on the state board, and Kathy Strauss, as promised, and thank you. Uh, uh, for letting them slip in late. And we just started, um, Kathy and Marianne, with uh, some of the folks uh, giving some invited presentations. Um, Bernard Taylor, Superintendent of Grand Rapids Schools, you probably know, so thank you very much. Well, it's nice to see you both, and welcome to Grand Rapids, and welcome to the Grand Rapids Public Schools. Um, again, as I was explaining to President Austin, um, our school district is not afraid to embrace the challenges of reform. I know there may be some who are uh, probably tired, or, or reform fatigue might be setting in, but the one thing about reform is that until every student is reaching their potential, then we're always going to be in a reform mode. And so I don't know that uh, reform with fatigue will ever be cured because, again, we have to do the best we can for all students with the resources we have. Our district is not afraid of shared sacrifice because we've been engaged in it over a considerable amount of time. We've cut over $70 million from our operating budget over the past 10 years, and we continue to do so. But we continue to innovate. We continue to build partnerships. We continue to look for innovative ways to serve our students effectively. One of the issues that we're going to attack aggressively is how we deal with, again, the student who needs more time than four years to be career or college ready. Now, the, I, I support the governor's call for education anytime, any place, anywhere, any rate, because quite frankly, some of the priorities that you have um, embraced are things that in Grand Rapids we have not been shy about. I'm glad to see, for example, that you want to enhance blended learning and virtual learning, because when we initiated that process last year, you would have thought the gates of hell were going to cave in because we dare said that there's a different way to offer instructional services to students. And I think imitation is the greatest form of flattery. So I think that because you're going to hear presentations that build upon our experience here in Grand Rapids, it makes me very, very proud that we were not afraid to step out front and say this is a way that we need to be looking at educating our students. But with, with the student who needs more time, we must figure out a way to serve them in a way that allows them to, to be remediated, to do it in a way where they don't pell out. One of the, the forward-thinking uh, leaders in education here is Dr. Ender, who is the president of GRCC. And when we had the conversation, he did say, let's figure this out together so that a benefit accrues to the student. He, his, his approach could have been very parochial because from a revenue standpoint, those students are bringing resources, but he didn't say that. What he said is, let's figure out what we can do to better conditions for students. 
But what that will require is a reexamination of how we calculate the dropout rate. So if a student needs more than four years, that student should be afforded that opportunity. Just as if a student needs less than four years to complete high school, then that student should be afforded that opportunity as well. But in terms of sharing of services, sharing of resources, if we can figure out a way to address this problem so that students don't pell out, meaning that they lose their Pell Grant eligibility before they finish their post-secondary experience. I think that from any level, uh, from a fiscal responsibility standpoint, from an educational planning standpoint, and from a student focus standpoint, we will be doing this community and its students a major service. That's dispensation that we're going to need from the State Board of Education. We've initiated this conversation with Superintendent Flanagan. Uh, he was very receptive to the idea, and we're going to get additional information to him. But um, I do believe that this is the type of work that the state board, the governor, our legislators are asking school districts and higher education partners to engage in. And I think here in Grand Rapids, we have shown that we can lead the way and provide quality examples of reform that is based on the best result accruing to students. And we stand ready to continue that in the future. Thank you very much, Superintendent Taylor. And thank you for you and your school districts hard work on this important topic. So we're going to ask um, our host ISD, um, Kevin Konarski, to come and, and share some overview of education issues, challenges as he views them. And then Ken, Kevin's going to be followed by Bill Smith, who's got a um, presentation on an interesting high school student engagement process underway here. So we'll have to get your presentation teed up as Kevin is sharing. Thank you, Kevin. I, I too, would also like to welcome you to uh, Kent County in, in Grand Rapids. We're very, very proud to share with you um, some of the innovative programs and work that we have going on in, in within Kent ISD. <clears throat> and welcome and appreciate you taking the opportunity to, to, to listen to those uh, here this afternoon. Um, well, I'm, I'm uh, pleased to have the opportunity to share the innovations with you. I think I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you just a bit about the concerns throughout our county in regards to, 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 to school funding. Um, certainly, we appreciate the action taken by the legislature just this week to, to restore, you know, through um, some one-time fixes, some of the dollars back into our, our, our educational funding system. But there's a great deal of concern with all of our local districts that this is truly still a permanent cut, and it would rebase the foundation grant back to levels that we would operate under back in 2005. And as excited as we are to continue moving forward with reforms, there's certainly the concern that the additional professional development, the additional um, uh, materials and technology that's needed to move forward, uh, we're going to be very limited in trying to move forward with those um, with the budget constraints that we'll be under. And if these additional dollars that are being um, infused into the system on a, on a one-time basis were to go, go away. Um, next year, we're starting all over again with the same structural problem, and, and we want to get away you know, from continuing to look at how we're going to fund our programs and move forward together to increase student achievement and continue to work towards what is, what is best for our, our students. So um, uh, I think, I, again, would be remiss if I didn't bring those concerns from our superintendents forward. Um, just last, uh, last spring, we engaged, or last fall, we engaged in a student survey where we surveyed um, over 17,000 high school students. And, and we moved forward with this in a manner to infuse student voice into some of the changes that we're recommending in our, throughout our schools in the county. And the results of that work will be shared in just a minute by Dr. Bill, Bill Smith, um, who is the superintendent of the Kent City Schools, and he also chairs um, the Secondary Redesign Committee for our, super, our Countywide Superintendents Association. And we do so because even though we have the challenges and reductions, um, you know, we continue to find ways to innovate and work together on behalf of improving student achievement for, for our students. A few other things that we definitely do agree with, with the governor in the reforms, and certainly there are things that we like about his proposal, is, um, uh, you know, the need to move away, you know, from seat time in the agrarian calendar and find new ways to move students more quickly through the system in, an, in advance through the use of technology, online learning, different resources to move students um, through the system in a manner that meets their individual or, or personal needs. 
we certainly, su certainly support that. Um, there are opportunities right now um, that we would like to take, more, take greater advantage of in regards to moving our students into early college opportunities and early er earning college credit at, a, at a, a quicker pace, a faster pace than we've been able to do so under the, the old system. Um, just in, uh, in, in an example would be, you know, quite often our students um, receive courses back in their base high schools or in our career tech centers where um, they are college curriculum level classes. And they may, through art articulated agreements, maybe through some direct credit ag agreements, situations where they can earn college credit. But quite often, those credits are not transferred to all universities in the state. And if the board could, could help support policy changes where we could move forward and that credit would be allowed to move forward from those um, classroom experiences to higher education experiences, they would create a much more seamless transition for our students to college. Um, also, right now, our students enroll in, in dual in, enrollment classes. And if truly we are going to move to a model where K-12 funding is shared um, with our higher, higher education partners, then um, I would hope that the uh, dollars spent in that, in that way would allow students to take dual enrollment classes where tuition wouldn't have to be paid to the colleges or universities for students to, get, to gain that credit. And those are some things to think about in the future as well. I know that um, in, my, in our discussion through Ken ISD with President Austin, um, you really want to hear about some innovation and we're really, really pleased to have Dr. Bill Smith share some of the things we're doing with high school reform in Kent County. So I'd like to introduce him at this time. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for your thoughtful um, recommendations of things we can work on together. Um, as Bill is getting set up, uh, Ben, I don't know, he may need a little help Maybe not. It's very it's technically savvy. Let me just remind people, um, public uh, folks who would like to speak, please um, pick up a form and, and drop it at the back. We'll collect those uh, shortly, and everyone who wants to have a few minutes will have a few minutes to um, give us your two cents and your recommendations and your experience. So we are uh, delighted to have uh, the chance to hear from some of the folks who already uh, asked for that opportunity. Can I just Absolutely. Hi, I'm uh, Mary Ann Yared McGuire, as John said uh, originally. I'm the treasurer of the state board and delighted to be here today. I want to thank the college for um, uh, hosting this event, and I want to thank all of you for um, attending and your willingness to provide your opinions and uh, comments on whatever's concerning you. Okay, uh, I'm Bill Smith. I am the chair of the Secondary Redesign Committee. The Secondary Redesign Committee is a committee that's developed through KISD. It involves uh, instructors, it involves superintendents, assistant superintendents, we have a lot of constituents that help serve the needs of, of uh, what we believe is a very significant issue that we need to address, and that is uh, secondary redesign. And there's a lot of research out there that, that supports the need to improve our high schools uh, and to improve the learning experience. Uh, that research that's out there oftentimes comes uh, from external sources uh, as opposed to internal sources. Uh-oh. I might have to do a little... Different click. I may have to work from over there. Do you mind? Do you? Cultivate student voice to stimulate engagement and drive change. Uh, we, we feel that if we can do these three things, then we'll be successful in, in helping to educate all students. As we go through our secondary redesign committee, 
We've done a lot of work, uh, especially what, what Kevin spoke to. Uh, we surveyed 17,000 plus high school students, and they thought that was kind of neat that here we are coming to them, asking them, what do they think about education? What do they think about their environment? And we've empowered their voice. As we've gone through this, we plan to continue this, this type of engagement work, and we want to engage not only surveys of students, but staff and parents as well. We found there are some things that we're doing well, and there are some things that we need to improve on. And, and so we'll cover both of those. We shared this information with our teachers, our principals, our parents, communities through school boards, most importantly with our students who provided us feedback and an explanation that allowed us even further research. So not only did we take the information that they provided us, then we broke them up into focus groups and went back and asked them to specific, specifically respond to what they said to us and what do they mean and how can we better serve them. So in this process, the result Many of you have probably heard of Bill Gates' three R's, rigor, relevance, and relationships. The result of what they told us was that that was kind of odd, that we needed to do a little work there with that. Our students indicated that most, uh, indicated the most important thing was relationships, followed then by relevance. And with those two key aspects, then, then they could have increased rigor and be successful. But critically, it was relationships first. We want to know that people care about us. We want to know what we're learning is relevant. They have no problem with the merit curriculum. Their problem is, is it relevant? Is it relevant to the world that they're going to face? So as we go through this process in the relationship-rich environment where content is relevant, students can achieve success on rigorous curriculum. They believe it. We believe it. We sh this should be easy. Well, it hasn't been too easy. So we're working on it. Now, without relationships, there can be no relevance. If, a, if an instructor has not built a relationship or a, a school district has not built a relationship with their children, there, it's very difficult to make that learning relevant, that content relevant. So relationships are key. Without relevance, there can be no rigor. If you ask students what it is that they're learning, the first thing they want to know is, why am I learning it? And then I'll tell you what it is. And if I, don't, if I don't see a rationale as to why I need to learn it, they're not going to take the time to do so. So students uh, want to learn about a guided, uh, through a guided experience facilitated, facilitated by someone who cares about them on a journey that is relevant to their life now and in the future. And they are willing to face challenging content. What's, what kids told us was they understand that there is the now, and they're doing well in that. And they'll do better if it's relevant. But they also understand that the now plays into the future. And they're OK with that, too. Uh, they, they're, they're OK to engage into a future perspective, but it has to be from someone that, that has built a relationship with them so that that can be relevant. Now, as we go through our process, the key to keeping students engaged in school is relationships and relevance. So when we talk about addressing dropouts and things like that, the key critical aspect is to address the, the, the key concepts that provide engagement, which are relationships and relevance. If they, don't, if, uh, if they don't form positive relationships with adults in the system, if they don't connect with their teachers, they're not going to be engaged. And it doesn't matter what strategy you use, that's best practice. So it kind of boils, boils down to some simple concepts. And if they don't understand how they will use the content they are learning, how it applies to the real world and to their future, they become further disengaged. So once you've lost them, you've lost them further if you can't connect it to what a career would be or how they'll use that information. So as we go through our process, without relations to relevance, the rigor is meaningless because they have no desire to pursue the content. We're disconnected. They're just, we're just sharing the same space. So the good news, and there is good news to this story, the vast majority of our students, 73%, are satisfied with their high school experience. 73% say, hey, this is a great place to be, and I love where I'm at, and I love what I'm doing. About the same percent have a positive relationship with at least one caring adult in the school to support their education and provide guidance. Our teachers are doing a great job. They're building relationships with kids. Our kids feel connected. Whoop. There we go. For the, uh, the, the first most critical issue, the relationship piece, I think that we can move on from that. We're doing a good job with that. Now, where do we fall short? The key aspect of where we fall short is 60% of the 11th graders in our survey, the students who this year are, the grad, are, who are graduating as the first seniors to master the Michigan Merit Curriculum, said they did not find their core content uh, requirements relevant to their future. That is a significant statement. 
This is the first group coming through under the new merit curriculum, and they don't feel engaged by the content. They don't feel like it's relevant. We've got to fix that. That's, that's the focus of what we're working on. Now, they didn't understand the importance of the material or how they would use it in the future, whether they intended to go to college or not. We, in the state of Michigan, every high school student is a college prep student now, and that's a good thing. But it has to be a relevant college prep curriculum. They have to see how they're going to use it. Now, we've fallen short on relevance, and that's, that's what the mirror image tells us. We've got to do a better job with that. So, as we go through, we ask them, how do we get better? That's where we come back to them. Uh, in the spring, we followed up with focus groups based on certain definable characteristics. We asked uh, female students, male students, uh, Hispanic students, African American students. We wanted their perspective from their, their vision, what they see schools are like, and how can we respond in a better way to their needs. And, and they told us some great things. The time the students were empowered to, uh, this time the students were empowered to define what they needed to make learning relevant. Here's the power of student voice. Probably the most important thing in secondary reform is an empowered student, okay? They're going to make the things different. They're going to make things change. When the door shuts to the classroom, an empowered student will make a better place of learning for themselves. And that's what we're, our job is to empower them. Here's what they said. Uh, this is a little bit of a skit there. <laughs> we'll just move on from that. Uh, basically, here's what they said. Students need relationships to be motivated. We know that. They want digital learning. They, want to be, they don't want to have to tune out the technology that's available to them at home uh, or, or around them. They want blended learning. Bernard talked about blended learning. Our kids want blended learning. They demand blended learning. They demand that teachers aren't guessing about how their performance is, and that's a good thing. They need an effective teacher in the classroom to be motivated. They have high expectations of their teachers. They don't just want to be put in front of a computer screen and told to learn. That's the key component that people have to understand. Kids don't want to just be put in front of a, an online learning program and say, okay, go at it. They want a guide. They want a facilitator. They want their learning to be defined by who they are and what they know and not know. They don't want to be taught things they already know. They want a diagnostic major to help them. And that's pretty sophisticated for our high school students. And they need connections to the real world, to businesses, to careers, to be motivated to learn rigorous content. As we go through this, what are we doing in response? And this is where it really gets exciting for us. These results are driving change in our system. Individual high schools are making changes based on student responses. If you look at Kent County high schools, almost every single one of those high schools, even though they're doing an excellent job, are making significant changes based on this data. This is an incredible center of an extreme, uh, uh, I, I guess the pinnacle of education is Kent County. And I've been around the state of Michigan, and I, and I can just tell you for my own kids going to school, this is where I want my kids to be because Kent County has got great school districts making innovative changes. Uh, all 20 of our superintendents called upon the ISD to create an innovation incubator, and this is critical. Getting 20 superintendents to agree on one mission is, is a challenge, and Kevin Konarska did a wonderful job getting us there. And, and so we're focused on a laboratory school to export new methods of teaching and learning to all buildings within our county. Basically, Kent Innovation High School opened in September with a ninth grade class of 100 students. Kent Innovation High School will be a project-based learning environment where students will work in teams on interdisciplinary real-life projects that merge subjects like biology, literature. The, the key concept here, it's all project-based. It merges two core content instructors to help blend the relevance of the learning. It's not taught in a silo. There, I don't know anybody that has a job where, our, where the first hour you're working on your math skills. The second hour you have to work on your writing skills. It's all blended together. And this is how we'll teach students. Teachers will be mentors, coaches, and facilitators. Uh, they will work on, on bringing real-world, problem-based, relevant learning experiences into the classroom and then redefining where the classroom is. The classroom just isn't, isn't where that door shuts. It's all over where learning can occur. So what's next for us? The plan to continue our student engagement work and, hope, uh, and we hope to uh, include regular engagement surveys of staff and parents as well. This is very important because as we start to evolve change, as we start to evolve a, a much more specific learning environment, we need to engage staff, we need to engage parents so that we keep focusing on what, what uh, is the best practices for us. We plan to create a dashboard of engagement that uh, uh, levels uh, all, uh, empowers all stakeholders in redesign process for 21st century learning environments. And we're trying to get away from classrooms and more towards learning environments, uh, redefining where learning occurs. Uh, for more information on any of this, I know that this was very quick. 
Uh, you can click, uh, click on our Student Voice uh, uh, webpage, and you'll get access to all different kinds of uh, information, uh, the research behind the Innovation Lab, how the lab school and the incubator concept works. Basically, this is a school that exhibits best practice, but it's not just designed for the 100 kids or the 400 as it's completed, but it's also designed for local districts to bring their staff into this environment, observe best practices, dialogue with their staff, and talk about how they can make those best practices relevant to their learning environment. All these pieces are available. My presentation uh, is Thank also you on a YouTube presentation to right here. To you this afternoon. And uh, if you go to that, it uh, doesn't look William like me, Smith. but it's my talking points converted to that. I like to, to share different types of technology of so that people City can see that. This was, uh, I learned this in about 15 the chair minutes. Of the so engage yourself. Association Secondary All right. Design Committee. Thank you. Very exciting uh, and good for you all to push that uh, student voice forward. That we have, we're, we're going to try to restrain ourselves given there's so many people that want to share and talk. Um, normally uh, at the state board we also try to restrain ourselves and not interject and, and follow up. But we do want that presentation, but I know it's online because we definitely want to learn more about what you're doing to, to follow the student's voice and uh, an example for many others. Paul Drummond, can you come up next? So Paul's the executive director with the Michigan Math Science Center Network. Uh, and again, if you just came in, uh, fill out a form in the back and we'll collect them. We're asking folks to speak uh, as exciting as, as their presentations are for three to five minutes if you can, so we can make sure to give everyone an opportunity to, to share uh, this afternoon. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President, and also uh, state board members, uh, Kathleen Strauss and Mary Ann McGuire. Um, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I represent the Michigan Mathematics Science Center Network. We are a network of 33 math science centers across the state. Uh, some of us are associated with universities such as Grand Valley State University and Central Michigan University, but we are also parts of intermediate school districts and resource education uh, service uh, uh, agencies as well. We're charged with professional development, uh, re resource clearinghouse re uh, services, uh, leadership, curriculum, uh, support. Uh, the some of the examples of uh, statewide projects that we have engaged in is the Algebra for All program. Uh, this was taken on as a direct request from the governor. Uh, it is a, an example of the first ever statewide blended professional development. It serviced over 800 teachers and impacted over 120,000 students. The, uh, it is also uh, an example of a successful partnership with the Michigan Virtual University. Uh, as a result of that work, it received the Michigan Education Excellence Award in 2011. And also as a result of that work, the Michigan Department of Education has asked that the Michigan Mathematics Science Center Network take the lead in creating and facilitating the design implementation of a statewide uh, partnership uh, regarding uh, a statewide vision and mission for STEM education in Michigan. Uh, the charge, uh, this charge is uh, to bring business and industry together with educators, to address proficiency levels of Michigan students as indicated on state and national assessments. Uh, we are going to be bringing together, the, again, business and industry to address workforce development and economic sustainability. Some of the partners involved in this, uh, at this point are the Michigan Virtual University, TARDEC, which represents the defense industry, uh, Ford Motor Company, the Michigan Science Teachers Association, McCall, the Michigan Department of Education, Automation Alley, and Square One Education Network. Um, we have also joined a, uh, a national network by hiring the Teaching Institute for Excellence in STEM to help us also realize our goals. Again, I want to thank you for allowing me to, uh, to present to the board. Uh, we're very excited about this next initiative, and we have three meetings planned at this point to make this become a reality within the state. Thank you. I'd like to add my <coughs> greeting, too. I'm Kathleen Strauss. Uh, I've been on the board a long time. I know a lot of you. Uh, and it's, it's great to be here and to hear what you're doing. 
I was especially happy to hear about the relationships and relevance, because that's what I've been talking about for several years, saying those are the two most important R's before we get to the rigor. And so the, the students confirmed it, so that's great. I'm really glad to be here and to hear all. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you for your leadership over the years. Um, Matthew Van Zetten, I know, uh, is here. Matthew is with the Kent County Family and Children's Coordinating Council. And then after Matthew, um, Marissa Higgs uh, from Mich Muskegon Opportunity uh, and the Michigan College Access Network. Is your colleague here, Marissa, yet? Oh, we'll come back for her and others who we've got forms. Thank you. Good afternoon. President Austin and fellow state uh, Board of Ed members, it's a privilege to share a few thoughts with you this afternoon about education and its intersection with other governmental entities. Um, my name's Matthew Van Zetten, and I'm the coordinator of the Family and Children's Coordinating Council in Kent County. We're the multi-purpose collaborative body or community collaborative. And um, in Kent County, we have 19 members that are appointed by our Board of Commissioners. They represent agencies, obviously, like DHS and the Circuit Court, ISD, um, CMH, Machine Works, the prosecutors, but it also includes consumers, nonprofit organizations, and philanthropy. It's a true round table of ideas and opinions on improving the lives of children and families. Um, for many years, we believe large public systems, school districts, private foundations, and nonprofit organizations have worked very diligently to improve the lives of children and families in Kent County. Um, for the most part, these efforts have been successful in making isolated impact. They've been improving one life at a time. However, when we look at collective indicators like poverty rates, abuse and neglect rates, overrepresentation of minority children in child welfare, standardized test scores of students in urban school districts, we see the situation for children are not, is not improving. Even the incremental improvements that we're making on an individual level are not enough to overcome the challenges facing um, families as they struggle to deal with the new reality in a global economy and a knowledge-based society. Recently, the Annie E. Casey Foundation published a study called Double Jeopardy. In it, they found the following. One in six children not reading proficiently in third grade does not graduate from high school on time, a rate four times greater than that of proficient readers. 22% of children who have lived in poverty for at least one year do not graduate from high school on time, compared to 6% of those who have never been poor. This jumps to 32% for students who are in poverty for more than half of their life. And rates of non-graduation were highest for poor blacks and Hispanic students at 31 and 33% respectively. And for me, this is the kicker right here. Even among poor children who read proficiently in third grade, 11% do not graduate from high school. That compares to 9% of subpar third grade readers who have never been poor. This is startling. Poverty can overcome academic achievement in certain instances. We know that Kent County children are on average ready for kindergarten as evidenced by First Steps, our Great Start Collaborative Baseline Report. But that study also concludes that there's a significant gap in readiness for children of color. It's projected that 22% of this year's kindergartners, 1,500 children across Kent County, are at risk of needing supplemental services by third grade. We also know that in Kent County, poverty rates for children have increased from 10.9% in 2000 to 18.2% in 2008, and free and reduced lunch rates have increased from 30.5% to 46.2%. And right now, 40% of all births in Kent County are funded through Medicaid. With 1,500 children annually at risk for not meeting third grade proficiency and increasing poverty rates, the question needs to be asked, where do we as a community and a state go from here? Because we don't believe this is just a one sector issue. It's our belief that there's not one silver bullet that will solve this challenge. Um, recently, John Kenya and Mark Kramer stated in an article in the Stanford Social Review, no single organization is responsible for any major social problem nor can one single agency or organization cure it. We hope that you as the State Board of Education could strengthen your ties with the State DHS Office and the Department of Community Health and look towards creating a common agenda and vision for children that centers on data and not ideology. 
We need a targeted and strategic approach that builds on our public and private investments. In Kent County, this means we are working to connect First Steps, Great Start, our early learning, early childhood effort, Believe to Become, which is a community neighborhood initiative, Kent School Services Network, our community school effort, our after school programs, our SAMHSA system of care grant, the county's resources that are general fund that are geared towards prevention services, as well as um, Schools of Hope, Centers of, Inno Centers of Innovation by GRPS in the Kent County College Access Network. Our goal is to create a pipeline of services demonstrated with metrics to show that how we can alleviate the effects of poverty, support children and families in meaningful ways, create a culture of learning, embrace the notion that every child in Kent County needs to meet certain milestones to have an opportunity to compete in this global economy. We believe the state could benefit from a similar approach. I've left a copy of my remarks here, as well as the articles I referenced. Thanks for the opportunity to share, and we appreciate you coming to Kent County and to West Michigan. Marissa, can you come up, and uh, if you need some help with your um, visuals, we can give it. Uh, per what Matthew said, please uh, share your written materials, email us, I've got cards, and, and we do want to share, particularly helpful are the specific recommendations which we're already hearing. Can you help us state board with this dual enrollment uh, financing effort which can help us realize our goals? Can you help us with this alignment with DHS? Those are the kinds of things that are so tangible and important and, and are why we're here so that we've got these broad goals, but how can we specifically advance them? So. Um, after Marissa, uh, is is Fiona Hart here? Hurt Fiona, great because I wanted Fiona's with the Grand Rapids Community College, our host institution, and is one of the last folks who uh, we invited to present, but has some very interesting curricular alignment uh, work going on with the high schools. And appreciate your being here. So, Marissa, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to share with you the work that uh, we at Muskegon Opportunity are doing as a local college access network. Um, as you may know, the Lumina Foundation um, it has really influenced the work that the Michigan College Access Network has been doing here around the state, and as such, has influenced the work of the local college access networks. Muskegon Opportunity is one of many, um, and so MCAN's goal is to increase the proportion of Michigan residents with high quality degrees and credentials from 35.6% to 60% by 2025. And high quality degrees, I must um, make sure we clarify, uh, is any degree that results or credential that results in um, a license or certificate and in the ability to perform a function, it makes you highly quali perform a task and makes you proficient in that task and that work. So as such, licensure, certificates, associates, bachelors, and um, advanced degrees from there. So this may look familiar to some of you. Um, levels of education for Michigan residents 20, ages 25 to 64 from the 2000 census. Um, you know, we have a total, as I mentioned, the 35.6% uh, graduation, or excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. 35.6% um, of uh, Michigan residents in this age bracket 25 to 64 have some form of post-secondary degree. Now, that doesn't sound like a whole lot. <laughs> and I think we have some work to do there. For Muskegon County, that number is a little bit different. Um, as you can take a look here, for Muskegon County, starting with the associate's degree, because we have many, 25% roughly, with some college, no degree. It's kind of a, an area where we really need to focus our, our efforts. But in addition to that, we are really working with our high, high school students um, primarily the 11th and 12th grade students, to get them um, prepared for some form of post-secondary education, uh, any edu post-secondary education that works for them, that is part of their goal, their passions, their desires. And so we're trying to help move this 25% of the uh, some college no degree into an associate's bachelor's or beyond, and we're really focusing our efforts right now on uh, high school students. 
So for Muskegon Opportunity, our goal is to graduate more Muskegon County students, high school students, ready for post-secondary education and through increased access to post-secondary and um, increased persistence, we will contribute to that 60% goal uh, by 2025. And for your reference, these are our uh, metrics, our evaluation plan. And uh, so we're working with a number of partners to um, achieve these particular goals, 5% uh, increase in county graduation rates and using the four-year cohort model, though given the new requirements, the uh, Michigan Merit Curriculum requirements, we may see that changing, I'm not sure, to a five-year cohort. 5% annual increase in the number of seniors who've identified a career pathway. That's really important because um, even though the tools are available to um, help students identify that, we're really not capturing data well enough to say, we know what it is you're saying you want to do when you get older, and we're going to help you get there because it's documented, and we have a path to help you get there. Um, so what we're doing is working with the school districts uh, to capture some information from career cruising where they identify um, the pathway of their choice. And then what we're doing uh, from there is taking that information, taking students, and helping them transition into the Michigan College Access Portal and uh, helping them find schools that will match up with their career interests. Uh, we're also increasing the number of our services, Muskegon Opportunity Services, that we provide to our schools. Um, we provide currently, oh gosh, a number of services. I have them uh, on the back table for you if you'd like to see them. Um, but we're going to increase those two every year and increase the percentage of county students using TIP, or the Tuition Incentive Program, scholarship money, the Pell money, and um, and. Uh, in the future, Promise Zone money. Uh, Muskegon County is uh, a Promise Zone, the only county-wide Promise Zone in the state of Michigan, and we are one of 10 Promise Zones. So in the future, we're hoping to also utilize Promise Zone money for our students. Increase the number of students completing the FAFSA. This is really critical. Um, without FAFSA, there is no Pell, and, uh, and to some extent, no other additional funding for our students and decrease the percentage of local scholarships that are left undistributed. Uh, we're working very closely with our community foundation to track the number of students who are accessing uh, those local scholarships, who are awarded the local scholarships, and the number of scholarships that go undistributed because there were students didn't meet the qualifications or they just weren't accessed, or quite honestly, we didn't have enough students um, even in the pool. So that's um, something that we're doing there. And uh, Muskegon Opportunity is a countywide community-driven initiative. So the things that we were talking about on the evaluation matrix are not done alone. Somebody mentioned we can't work in silos. We're now working in silos in Muskegon County. Uh, these are just a handful of our community partners. And, um, it, you know, it's so extensive. I, I, I couldn't get them all on here, and I do apologize for that, but, you know, like Department of um, Energy, Labor, and Economic Growth is not on here, but they're a big partner of ours. Um, we also have Department of uh, Education and Training. We have um, just so many more <laughs> that we're working with, but they come around our table uh, every other month and help inform the initiatives and the work that we're doing. Some of our funders who are also um, participating in, uh, well, monetary ways, but um, some of these funders also sit our at our advisory table and help us with um, executing, brainstorming, and uh, pulling research and data so that we know uh, what it is we need to do and how we need to go about getting there. Uh, as I mentioned, I have some of our initiatives on the back table and a handout for you, but I just have a couple of them here uh, for your reference. One of uh, probably the most promising and innovative ways that we reach our uh, 11th grade students in the county is through the Muskegon Opportunity Know How to Go Roadshow. And we employ uh, Know How to Go, which is a national campaign. And um, we use in, in that show, it's, well, 
let me back up and say that it's, it's an interactive talk show in which we take the students on a financial journey from dropping out of high school, your average earning power, if you drop out of high school, and then we compare that to the jobs that are available to those students if they choose to drop out of high school. In addition to that, we take them through high school completion, license and certificate programs, associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees. And so we really help them understand that the more you learn, the more you earn. There is a capacity there of incremental growth um, financially for them. And in addition to the more you learn, the more you earn, is uh, this notion that not every student wants to go on to a four-year degree. Um, it's a very personal choice uh, you know, that they have to make. They have to identify what their interests and their skills and their talents and their hobbies are. And uh, we encourage them to look at one and two year, uh, one, two and four year degrees. Military is even an option in our show as well because there are transferable skills, vocationally speaking, from the military into the workforce. And so it's very important that they get that message. Um, we also uh, help them understand which in institutions locally um, they can uh, reach out to for one, two and four year degrees and the types of financial aid that they can use or even understanding what financial aid is so that they know how to access post-secondary and that fin finances are not a problem. They're not going to be a barrier for our students. Um, it has been recognized as an innovative means of putting useful information to the hands of high school students. Um, for the sake of time, I didn't use our pre and post show surveys that we've done for the last year and a half, but the resounding uh, response from our students have been that uh, this is exactly the way in which they want to have this com information communicated. They don't want talking heads. They want interactive. We use music. We use um, the uh, PSAs that are available from Know How to Go as our commercial breaks. And so we keep it very lively and engaging. And um, for those of you who are wondering what MCGCP is, that's the... Um, Michigan Comprehensive Guidance and Counseling Program, benchmarks and standards. Um, as a licensed counselor, I want to make sure that the work we're doing aligns with the uh, benchmarks and standards that are out there. We have the Muskegon Opportunity uh, Tuition Incentive Program pamphlet. We've uh, worked with um, the Office of Scholarships and Grants, and we've kind of partnered with Michigan Department of Education and the Treasury Department um, for this type of information so that our students have a comprehensive uh, tool to use with their parents. The schools have a comprehensive tool to use with the students. And um, so essentially, conversation can happen around what is the tuition incentive program? Should I or should I not apply? And what are the qualifiers? We really wanted to empower the students to have this conversation with their parents. Um, and I will say that one of the school counselors in our county was very excited. She stopped me in the hallway and said, this is the best piece of information you could have handed me because I have more parents coming in with their notes on that pamphlet um, and asking questions than I would have had you know, just having a conversation with them. In addition to the pamphlet, we've... Um, really streamline a process, the tuition incentive program uh, process and uh, the screening process. And basically, it's we're working with the Office of Scholarships and Grants to help screen the students in Muskegon County uh, for eligibility. And this is something that has been phenomenal. We have seen incremental growth um, upwards of 50% year over year in the number of students who are eligible and receive the tuition incentive program money. Uh, lastly, we have a mentoring program and uh, workshops where we've partnered with the Michigan Department of Education, their outreach unit. They come every month and co-facilitate uh, timely topic workshops for juniors and seniors, parents, mentors, and um, so we're doing some great work, and I know you want me to wrap up, so I will. But again, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see another community organizing around higher education attainment and with your partners, including the community college over there. I know um, you had me, I was confused for a minute when I saw that 5% of seniors have a career path. For, for a moment, I was thinking about senior citizens, and I was thinking, that's a little late for that. Maybe it's because we're conflating, we're taxing their pensions to pay for schools. But 
Um, this community college, like every community college, has so many roles they play in innovation and support system for education. And so really appreciate um, Fiona Hurt being here with the um, School of Workforce Development to share a few minutes on uh, some of the work they're doing as a partnership with the K-12s. And then we will continue to uh, gather perspective from the rest of you all I know who are eager to speak. So again, appreciate people being as brief as they can be, uh, five minutes, uh, and giving us that chance. Oh, Fiona, you're not ready to go? Okay, well, thank you. And, uh, Kathy or Marianne, anything that you want to um, add while we're waiting for a moment? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, have a few moments with you to uh, present um, some exciting work that has been going on at Grand Rapids Community College, Senator Grand Rapids Community College, um, and also has affected work around the state. Um, in 2009, Grand Rapids Community College began its work on what's called programs of study. You may have heard that term used in other forms, but I will explain it in just a minute. We were asked to lead the state through a grant from the former Department of Energy, Labor, and Economic Growth in, cooper in cooperation with Michigan Community Colleges, and we began the Michigan Community College Programs of Study. Um, initiative. Our goal for this work was to support and improve the student success initiatives, i.e. graduation and completion, um, at the community colleges. This component was also a requirement of our federal Carl D. Perkins work. What you see in front of you is our website where this information is located and additional information. There are also our handouts at the back um, for those of you who are in the audience today. And let me just um, briefly describe what a program of study is. Um, in essence, it is a map. Um, there have been references to providing a career pathway, and, but this is a, um, I want to say, a very deep dive map into a student from both high school to college uh, is it's defined as a sequence of instruction based on recommended standards and knowledge of skills consisting of coursework, co-curricular activities, worksite learning, service learning, and other learning experiences. The concept is a rich and deep experience for students coming in from secondary to post-secondary education. The idea also is for that secondary student then to have a map of their pathway in a particular occupational area that will also continue them on not only through Grand Rapids Community College or another a community college in the state but also to a four-year institution as is spoken here clearly today around that credentialing that um, degree that is required for a family wage job. Um, the outcomes of this work are to meet and exceed the requirements within the Federal Perkins Act align technical and academic competencies and assessments for secondary career and technical courses to community college programs of study, and for youth and adults to identify prerequisite knowledge, skills, and or courses and assessments required to be successful upon entering a college occupational program. Let me give you a little history of what we've been doing. In 2009, nine colleges and 15 programs piloted Michigan's program, programs of study development process. Each college followed, followed a 10-step process that we worked for over a year in developing in our pilot year 2009 that involved in-depth course-to-course content comparisons and alignment, admissions assessment, and industry skills and knowledge competencies. Let me share with you some of the highlights. We increased and an intensive focus on data and student success in programs. Example, looking at AccuPlacer scores and CUT scores to look at those in the correlation with performance further on in their occupational um, work. Each program looked at reading levels of high school texts and college texts and their correlations. No surprise that, the, um, that some colleges found that the reading levels of their texts were either too low or too high to make that transition for students a seamless one looked at college entrance assessment scores. Not surprisingly, the better a student's reading and math scores were, the greater his or her success rate were in college. Several 
Several discovered that interpersonal affective issues have impacted success and completion as much, if not more, than academic skills and abilities. For example, um, law enforcement for students in our police academy and other police academies around the state, Michigan um, MCOLs, the licensing board, rated communications as the most important characteristic for effective job performance. That was certainly key finding in the work that was done in our law enforcement area. High school re relationships were strengthened through this process, through the high school faculty participation, working with community college faculty on this process simultaneously. One progress focused on the alignment to industry certification rather than high school alignment. Example, computer programming and Microsoft certification. Another used the program of study process to revitalize their program by offering spe program specific orientations. For 2010-2011, we have seven colleges and 15 additional programs that we have begun to, begun to develop as well, and the final reports for those which will be due the end of, this, of June 2011. But let me speak to a concurrent project that worked as the foundation for our occupational programs. Not only were we doing, as I said, the occupational programs of study work, we also were beginning, um, began in 2009 what's called curriculum alignment work. Um, all of the documents that support this work are out on our website. As I said, it's the grcc.edu backslash programs of study. Um, and you will be able to find the specifics on each one of these programs that I hope you'll find useful at some point. But let me speak to um, our curriculum alignment work. GRCC, while working on these occupational programs, as I said, had piloted a curriculum alignment project, and this meant that for those general education or arts and sciences courses that are the foundation of transfer, but they are also the foundation for many of our occupational programs. As I've as I spoken to the, the need and the exploration around reading, writing, and math, those are certainly key competencies for multiple careers. Um, and it, w it was felt that Grand Rapids Community College would pilot that work by looking at um, the learning outcomes or key courses of, that are offered at Grand Rapids Community College with the state high school content expectations or Huskies. So alignment of both occupational and academic high school content enhanced the pr program of study development and, and engages college faculty with high school faculty and will enhance the transition of students to college. So in 2010, we began with the sciences. We didn't begin with the easy, we began with the sciences. Biology, chemistry, earth science, physics, and then we also um, undertook English. These were, and reading as well. We are going to be in this, um, in 2010, 2011, we will, will be completing mathematics and also social sciences to look at this curricular alignment again from secondary to post-secondary education. Here are some of the findings that we discovered in this work. Clear line of consistency across GRCC coursework and the pre prerequisites needed for GRCC college courses. High school recommended levels cannot be assumed to have been covered when students arrive at a community college. It appears that recommended levels are ancillary to in high school, while this analysis indicated that many are prerequisites for GRCC courses. Students may not have been exposed to some content areas for a significant length of time in their grades 9 through 12. The concern was depth and acquisition of knowledge. Some components of high school expectations are not deemed important, vital for their success in these respective college courses. There seems to be an area of need of needed discussion with those driving high school content expectations at the state level in terms of post high school utility. Here are some value added and recommendations that came as a result of this work. The process would be beneficial to, to cover in a gathering of college and high school teachers, including counselors as well. The correlation of college success to students MME would be a worthwhile longitudinal study. Awareness by college faculty of the high school expectations would allow college content to extend more and repeat less of high school material. Documents the high school content expectations need to be reviewed periodically and consistently. And last but not least, K-12 to higher ed, there is a lot to learn from each other in the quest for student success as they transition to post-secondary education.
All right, um, I'm gonna begin to call others up and please, if you're comfortable speaking from here or the table, to share your thoughts. Uh, George Williston from Delton, is George still with us? Thank you, George. And after George, we'll um, invite um, Amy Bruckhuisen. Bruckhuisen, thanks, Amy, sorry. Thank you. Hello, my name's George Williston. I'm a teacher at a small rural school, uh, Martin, and I teach seventh through 12th grade and I was with them today. And uh, I'm a woodshop teacher. Uh, my middle school students have won the state competition in woodworking for three years in a row now, building wonderful furniture. If middle school students are given a chance and are engaged, they can do wonderful things. I bring a, uh, which I sent some of you on email, uh, a study from Harvard saying that kids need more paths to career set careers and that uh, we should look at what the Europeans are doing in that way. So that only 30% of the jobs need a four-year degree. So I bring another little study from Manpower saying that the uh, lack of skilled workers is going to threaten the uh, economic recovery. Welders, electricians, plumbers, and people like that. And uh, I don't want to take too much time, but I agree completely with relevance that you to engage kids, they need to see it as relevant. And so much of what is in the curriculum that they're presented with, they do not see as relevant and they become disengaged or resistors. So we need to try to be relevant. And middle school is a very important time to engage young people. They're still very enthusiastic in seventh and eighth grade and uh, uh, my friend John and I have an idea for a hands-on academy, which would be exposing them to units of work uh, where they could try their hands at things uh, when they're forming their character and their opinions about themselves. Uh, right now, the middle school students, uh, they get their individualized education plan by looking, going to the library and looking at uh, some videos and deciding what they're interested in, and that's where their education plan comes from. And I would put forward that if kids can try things, uh, different skills, I mean, we have all kinds of kids, and cer certainly a lot of them are gonna go on to college and that merit curriculum suits them very well, but for the kids who do not have those kind of aptitudes, we need to find things where they can be engaged and become successful members of the community. So I would say the merit curriculum is not for all students. The curriculum needs to be flexible based on individual students' needs. Um, that you should consider the ACT work key standards for some graduates, uh, which they have standards of math and reading for trades and different skills, and they can achieve silver gold levels of those uh, standards and that that should be allowed for some students. I see a lot of kids struggling with Algebra 2 and uh, I talk to a lot of skilled trades people and Algebra 2 is not uh, uh, a part of what they use uh, to do sheet metal, uh, plumbing, electrical work. And so we are, I would say, wasting a lot of time for some people and uh, they, they should be redirected. I would also say that uh, Bill Gates is a great entrepreneur and a very rich man, but he's never been a teacher for one year, and so he's only guessing about teaching. That wasn't Bill Gates applauding, I gather. Did Bill join us? Thank you very much. I'm Amy Bruckheisen, and then Chris Jurens, is it? I apologize. Jurens, is Chris still here? Great, Chris. Thank you. I'm going to go collect. If you haven't filled out a form, uh, they're in the back. I'm going to go grab the rest of them and um, appreciate your comments. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. My name is Amy Brookhuisen. I'm a family consumer science educator at East Kentwood High School and a member of Michigan Jumpstart. Thank you for allowing me to take a few moments this evening to address the following issues. Who is Michigan Jumpstart? What is the vision of Michigan Jumpstart? Why financial literacy is important? and why financial literacy needs to be required. Michigan Jumpstart Coalition is a conglomeration of more than 30 private, public, and nonprofit organizations that seek to improve the personal financial literacy of Michigan's young adults. Just like the National Jumpstart Coalition, 
the Michigan, I'm sorry, the Michigan Coalition endeavors to increase the prominence of financial literacy of young, keep, young people, develop, disseminate, and encourage the use of standards for grades K through 12 and promote the teaching of personal finance. The Michigan Jumpstart Coalition envisions a time when all Michigan young people will have access to personal finance education in order to develop the necessary skills to be financially competent upon graduation from high school. I have some statistics I would like to share with you regarding the importance of financial literacy. According to the 2009 Young Adults and Money Survey sponsored by Charles Schwab, 64% say financial fitness is more important than physical fitness and the majority, at 51%, believe that financial education in school, grades K through 12, is more important than both physical education and sex education combined. However, money, many in this age group, and we're talking 18 to 25, admit that they don't feel adequately prepared to make good financial choices when it comes to using debt wisely, that's 28% who said that, saving for the future at 40%, or investing their money at 43%. When asked which aspects of personal finance they wish they had learned before entering the workforce, living within a budget at 45% and the importance of saving at 42% rise to the top of their list. Students of all ages are craving the information that personal finance classes promote. We as school districts and as a state all want the same thing for our students, to launch them into this world to be successful and productive members of society. We should be equipping them with the tools that prepare them for their future. Personal finance is the tool that will help our children learn to live within their means by creating spending plans, how to save for now and the future, which helps them meet their short-term and long-term goals, how to use credit wisely, investment options, maintain and balance a checkbook, make wise purchasing decisions, and understand how to protect themselves from scams and identity theft and much more. I hear over and over again from parents that they wish they had this class in high school, and I hear from students now and in the past how this class should be required over algebra or geometry because it's applicable to their lives. Why should it be offered in high school? Because 56% of parents believe that high school graduates are unprepared to manage their personal finances responsibly. Over half of all parents say they don't get set good examples when it comes to handling their own money and are not capable of properly teaching their children. The sooner we begin incorporating personal finance into our schools, the better off our students will be once they are on their own. Incorporating per some personal finance in an already crammed required course is not enough. Students need to have a standalone course that shows them how to apply math skills to their everyday lives. Once students use the information and see what their parents go through on a regular basis, they will have more appreciation for what their parents have done for them financially, which in turn makes the student conscientious about their own financial situation and decisions that they will make. If the thought of how can districts afford one more required course enters your mind, the answer is quite simple. There is free curriculum available to teachers. Family economics and financial education, which we like to call FIFI, and National Endowment for Financial Education, which is NEFI, are two well-known curriculums that comply to state and national standards. Both offer state and national trainings for educators. Mm. The National Jumpstart Clearinghouse offers many free and reduced cost materials that educators can use in their classrooms. Family and consumer science educators are already certified to teach the subject, and with many school districts decreasing this department, this is one way to help revive it. I would like to conclude with a few testimonies that I received from students regarding what they have gained in my personal finance class. Aaliyah Coleman, who's 18 and who's going to study culinary arts, stated, I learned a ton of things from Mrs. Brookhuisen's personal finance class. The main thing that I learned is how to manage my money. Money is an important thing. It affects many aspects of our lives. We all need to learn how to, how to have and use money correctly because if we don't, our lives will be full of money drama. The most important thing I learned is that my credit is important. Credit really affects every aspect of my life, from where I live to what job I can get. Just on a side note, Alea is a student who took the information about my goal setting lesson and applied it to her own life by figuring out how much money she would need to set aside each month in order to save up a certain amount, sum of money in order to take her mom to New York City with her. Courtney Huff, she's also 18, 
is thinking about studying event planning. And she stated that personal finance has taught me a lot, but most of all, appreciation and responsibility. This class further enhanced the lessons my parents have tried to teach me. Lessons like having a much bigger appreciation for money and even more for savings and staying debt free. I have learned that money is a full-time responsibility and it is up to me to take care of my money. Having a safety net, and it is my responsibility to make wise financial decisions. This is full-time responsibility takes planning, thoroughly thinking out steps and choices, and complete follow-through. My favorite part of this class it is not just one more random nonsense or boring math class that I may never use again or apply to my life, but a class that I will use every day, all the time. This class is real life. This class is reality. The things that I have learned will be applied to my life constantly. Finally, as my students were getting ready for their final exams this week, I had a student who came unprepared, and, I, and he asked me if he could borrow a pencil. I said to him, give me your shoe, and he thought I was joking. Then a student shouts out, it's collateral. You got to give up something in order to get something. Learning about collateral during our housing unit, a student applied it to their current situation. That is what personal finance is all about, taking pertinent information and applying it to your own personal situation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Jurians. I am a failed school board candidate. I gave it my best shot and I didn't make it. I'm also the parent of a student in the Grand Rapids Public School System who's scheduled to go to Union High School. And as you know, Union is not doing so very well with failure to achieve adequate yearly progress and its dropout rate. With that said, 85% of every dollar in a school budget goes to health care and administrative costs. That should make you upset enough to set your hair on fire. Michigan teachers are among the highest paid teachers in the nation. They have an insurance plan that many people would consider a Cadillac. The Grand, a Grand Rapids public school teacher pays approximately 5% of their health insurance. The district is, on the, is, on, is uh, on the hook for the rest of it. I work for the largest health care provider on the west side of Michigan. My, my employer owns my HMO and I pay almost 27% for my health care, and I don't have nearly half the benefits that the MEA and the union teachers have. The cost of health care is one of the biggest factors in a budget. One way to rein in the exorbitant cost is by removing health care bargaining or health care from collective bargaining. You can also make the school board the holder of the insurance policy for the school. That way, you can put out bids for cheaper insurance and not have to be held hostage to MESA, which is one of the most the, which is the money-making arm of the MEA, since f almost 400 of some school districts in, Grand in Michigan use MESA. Another way to uh, rein in the costs is to make Michigan a right-to-work state. That way, the union loses its ability to coerce the school board into paying for MESA because teachers who don't agree with the union or might not like their ideological stance don't have to join a union to be a teacher. Without a base of ready money, the union will not be able to ride roughshod over the local school boards, therefore making negotiations easier, and teachers will have a contract sooner. Because when a teacher doesn't have a contract, hmm. the step raises and the previous contract still applies. A union teacher gets paid for going to union activity. Not only does the school district pay for that, but the school district also has to pay for the substitute teacher to come in. Everything that a union teacher does over and above what they're required, they get more money. If they have more than a certain number of children in their class, they get extra money. If they, do, if they uh, coach a sporting event, they get extra money. One of the ways to rein in this cost would be, repeat by, would be either repealing or amending PARA, the Public Employee Relations Act. Tenure reform also will help rein in the cost because it costs the school district anywhere from $100,000 or more to get rid of a teacher. And a teacher in Schwartz Creek Michigan was replaced into the classroom despite the fact that several medical professionals and the school district's own 
people said she wasn't fit to be in a classroom. She was a counselor exhibiting strange behavior is what the report said. And she didn't apply, she didn't uh, do what she was required to do. The time period ran around, came around, it expired, she was reinstated with full benefits and her back pay. To avoid these kind of things from happening, as I say, PARA needs to be repealed or amended. More money is not the answer to restoring education. Removing the union from education is the beginning of freedom for the teachers and letting them do what they do best, and that is teach. Because learning potential thrives when a teacher can just teach and doesn't have to worry about looking over their back shoulders. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Travis Thompson. I'm the director of West Michigan Academy of Arts and Academics. We're a charter school in Spring Lake, uh, and we are consistently on the top performing charter schools list in the state of Michigan. Um, the reason I'm here today is that public education in Michigan is at a critical juncture regarding funding, choice, and innovation. And to me, charter schools represent two of those ideals, choice and innovation. I have a group of about 400 students who receive top-notch education on a daily basis. Our test scores demonstrate high levels of proficiency, our parents demonstrate a high level of commitment, our teachers a deep level of involvement, and our students demonstrate what a creative, intelligent, college-ready student looks like. Charter schools currently receive about $1,400 less funding per pupil than our traditional public school colleagues. As we jockey our 2011-2012 school year budget, we realize, as many charter schools and traditional public schools do, that we are already operating at a bare-bones budget. Sure, there are ways to tighten our belt with regards to supplies and shared services, but nickel and diming approximately 200,000 from a small budget is not an easy task when you're also facing dramatic increases in our health insurance. And that represents about an 8% reduction in our budget, which to some of my colleagues in the room isn't it's a mere drop in the bucket, but to us it's, it's kind of a big deal. High performing schools should be recognized for their achievements in times of limited dollars and increased demands from state and federal mandates. I am charged with producing college-ready students and cutting funding will limit the number of experiences that I can provide for my students. West Michigan Academy has produced an award-winning curriculum based on arts integration. We hold very close to our hearts the belief that integrating art into our curriculum is one of the factors contributing to our overall success. We boast a meet proficiency rate of greater than 90% and traditionally outperform many of our neighboring districts. We currently have 41 students on a waiting list for next year which would bump our enrollment up 10%. I would love to admit them into our building, but given that we are space limited, we cannot expand given the, the potential cuts in per pupil funding. Seeking funding sources outside of our state aid is also difficult with pending cuts because we will have to show an operating budget that is potentially in the negative. I applaud Governor Snyder for looking at ways to unlock the limit on charter schools and rewarding innovation and creativity in our schools. In 2008, President Obama pledged his support to arts education. And a recent study completed by the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities demonstrated the effectiveness of arts integration in our schools. The study found that students who participated in arts education were four more times likely to have high academic achievement and three times more likely to have high attendance. Arts integration that utilizes multi-sensory based techniques causes more information to be stored in a long-term memory. This study, touched, this study touched students from all ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds. The reason I bring this up is because arts are typically one of the first items to be removed from a budget, and the United States now, more specifically the state of Michigan, needs to produce creative and innovative students. The business world recognizes this and is asking for students who possess those skills. Doing more with less should not be the mantra of public education in Michigan. We need to be the leaders. Thank you for the time and opportunity. Thank you. Hope I'm not that last dog. Um, I want to respond to the uh, banter about charter schools with some empirical evidence. Uh, I understand there are some outstanding charter schools, but the empirical evidence shows there is no cross-the-board evidence of any academic uh, uh, betterment than the public school. 
What we do find, though, with the charter school, with empirical evidence, is that they have a much higher rate of attrition, particularly with the first school year, um, as much as uh, two to 300 times higher rate of attrition. When teachers are asked why that was, it was found, and I don't list this in order of seriousness, but it was found that the curriculum was already established and that the teacher was expected to just replay that. The teacher, therefore, could be very easily replaced by another teacher who would just step into the reins of the already existing curriculum. Uh, besides the high rate of attrition found in charter schools, another difficulty was, uh, and you have to go back to the history of the derivation of charter schools, with which if you go back to Friedman in Chicago, he went to the south during the days of the segregation where there were many irate white parents who wanted to find a way around the uh, federal implementation of segregation. And Mr. Friedman said, we'll call them schools of freedom, school of choice, many other monikers, but it's interesting those monikers remain to this day, and those that extol the virtues of charter schools use that moniker, that it does give you a school of choice. But historically, that goes back to a racial derivation where people did not want to mix their students with the black students. The black students initially then, once these charter schools took hold, received the same lack of uh, benefits and the same quality of supplies uh, that they experienced before. That history aside, what's wrong with a charter school? First of all, it's not a public school, although they'll insist it is a public school. They'll insist uh, endlessly that it's a public school. It's public in this vein, it receives public funding. It's not public in accountability. The boards are not publicly elected boards. To me, the idea of having a community input into my local school is a great American privilege. And charter schools do not take that into account when they extol all the virtues of why they should replace and supplant the public schools. I would point to the segment, and this is not organized, I just came here, I'm sorry I didn't have my response written out, but I would uh, point to the handout that talks about actual recommendations from the board that's facing me now to Governor Snyder. Uh, it's on page three. It's titled uh, Michigan State Board of Education Improvement and Reform Priorities, Recommendations to Governor Snyder and Legislature. On page three, it is being recommended that there be a public-private partnership to deliver reforms. I would remind everybody in this room, there's been a public-private relationship between the state of Michigan and the public schools that goes back decades. It's called taxation. Private entities pay taxes. They used to. They don't pay many today. The tax rate from the private sector is being minimized and minimized. That old time partnership said that the private corporations would pay taxes and then state certified educators would take that tax money and design programs and design initiatives commensurate with their training. That's been replaced now. The partnership today says we want partnership with a photo op. We'll come to the school and we will give millions of dollars, this is private uh, corporation speaking, and once we give that money that should have been given through taxation, now we'll use it as a photo op, and now we have strings attached in that we can control curriculum, we can control other objectives. That switch has gone unknown to the American public. But I remind you as I finish here, there had been a private-public partnership in education, and it was formed through taxation. Now that's been obliterated, and instead of that relationship, it's become an authoritative grab where we will take over the schools and we will get rid of the ills that we just uh, a few minutes heard about. I thank you for the time to speak, and I wish I had been better organized. Carol Render is still here. Okay, but please uh, try to keep uh, five minutes. Come, come along, man. And you are, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Louise Wilson. I'm not selling anything. I'm just a teacher. Um, I teach at Central. I'm sorry, but in the state of Michigan, in the state of Michigan at the moment, we are sort of gum on everybody's shoe. Um, I teach at uh, Central High School up here in Grand Rapids, 
And I've got two things that I want to talk about, but if I have time now, I'll come back later. Um, first is student improvement. I'm just warning you. I have students who are entering high school with math skills at the third grade level. Uh, the, norm is, the norm for my students is a fifth grade level, and a few of them are able to work at the ninth grade level. Unfortunately, I don't know which students they are before classes begin because I don't have access to their skill level until after classes start. And in any case, it doesn't matter because the curriculum they must follow is already dictated. I've got classes of up to 90 students per class divided into sections, so I see them once every three days. We're not making relationships. They have no textbooks. They're not given pencils. Attendance is not required. State boards clearly stated they think this is a great idea, as the students can engage in distance learning if they have online access at home. This applies to fewer than 50% of my students. Our program doesn't run at the Grand Rapids Public Library. Students who arrive in high school at the fifth grade level are, of course, unlikely to participate or achieve at a high school level. There are academic reasons why we do not present algebra and geometry to most classes of fifth graders, but at high school, we do that every day. Since the students do not show any improvement in skills between 8th and 10th grade for our whole district, it's apparent that the students are being passed in classes when they've not obtained the skills represented by that class. Students are passed along to the next class regardless of their skill level and whether or not they pass prior classes. The State Board of Education seems to think it's just fine for students to, quote, make up credits by using online learning that students can pass by looking up answers online. I'm not sure that looking up answers online or from your buddy's thumb drive replaces actual math skills, but the State Board seems to think it's okay, and it's encouraging this canard along with our, um, our own school board. I do know that students are graduating with transcripts that say they have successfully completed and know the state prescribed material for high school mathematics, and it is clear they do not, based on the remediation rates in colleges. Perhaps the State Board could reduce the requirements for high school courses down to a sufficient amount that could actually be learned during a typical class time in a year to promote the possibility of genuine completion. The current state system fails to acknowledge the presence of most of my students, those who are not at grade level. Instead of encouraging schools to help those students improve, it punishes or prohibits this assistance by imposing penalties if students do not graduate in four years of high school. The state prescribes courses with too much material and then turns a blind eye to students who are passed through these courses but then need remediation in college. If the state would get rid of the penalty for providing more than four years of education in high school and encourage schools to get students up to grade level, we could provide the remediation in high school at a lower cost. It might take two or more years to move students from their fifth grade level to the ninth grade level, but then they might, would, might be able to successfully learn the high school math prescribed by the state. The present method of lying and passing students through high school courses so they can take remedial classes in college makes no sense. Um, this, error is, this difficulty is compounded by the errors on the 2010 MME pass rate of high schools. I don't know if you've had that report. I did send it to the MDE. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Perhaps the state board could use data from the, M from the MEEP eighth grade tests and ask each school district what's being done to bring students up to grade level who are not proficient in their elementary careers. Clearly expecting one teacher to provide years of remediation in a few days and also a year of on-level education for hundreds of children every week is not effective, nor would we expect it to be. It just gives us someone to blame. Administrators are very fond of the adage, a rising tide raises all boats, and they urge everyone to raise the bar. As a scuba diver, I can assure you that there's a lot of wrecks offshore and a rising tide just makes them a deeper dive. Unless we can first refloat our sunken treasures, we're not doing them any favors by drowning them deeper. Should I carry on? A couple more minutes, okay. please. Thank you. I also have comments on teacher assessment. First, I would like to say thank goodness for unions and tenure. At a meeting last year, a charter school operator told me he would like to offer me a job. I told him I'd be gone from his organization the first time I spoke up. Nobody has to listen to me but they don't, they don't get to fire me just because I speak. And that's the number one thing about unions and tenure. Please don't get rid of them, because I won't be speaking. I teach at Central High School. Last year, I taught at City High. Last year, I had students who were performing well above grade average and continued to perform at the expected rate of improvement. I was encouraged and did provide them with project-based work, and the materials for success were provided by the school, including textbooks and pencils. Students took advantage of online learning in the classroom and at home. 
Most students came to school every day. They emailed me from home. It was fantastic. This year, I'm at Central High. I have students who perform on average at the fifth grade level. Along with most students in the district, they do not show much improvement between eighth and 10th grade. I see my students only every three days as they rotate between me and two other teachers. Most students have missed more than 10 days this semester as they did last semester. The pace is dictated by the online curriculum selected by the district. Students do not have textbooks, either in print or e-books. E and I have to have a 15-minute argument each week to be able to get 20 pencils for the 250 or so students that circulate through my room. There are no projects, which is a good thing, as we had no supplies until the end of April. Um, am I personally any less of a teacher than I was last year? My teaching has been cut out from under me by the district. Including test scores from students as an evaluation of teachers is surely designed to discriminate against teachers who are willing to work with struggling students and reward those who work only with pre-selected students of higher achievement. I suggest the state board audit and make sure that required items are being supplied to students. Send an email or survey to each, student, each teacher in each district and ask them what they lack for students. Automation can sort what each district needs. Protect names so students, uh, so teachers, I'm sorry, so teachers do not fear retaliation for honesty. Follow up and make sure each district follows the law. Survey teachers and ask them whether they have any freedom to change method, content, or style of delivery of instruction. Use the captured data to examine not only the performance level of children, but also their attendance in class. As background, um, I do have uh, degrees in physics. I have been a research scientist. I have been um, an engineer in deve various developmental fields. And this is sort of my third career. I have never used my education less. Thank you. Oh, what, what was the name of that report or speaking to them? The name of the report, it was a report on, um, on, the, 2000 and, on the 2010 um, MME pass rates in Central High School. Which you sent to the department? Chris Jansen. Okay. Please take our email too and make sure we get that again. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Let's, um, have Louise Wilson and then John Edgerton, and I think I see, oh, I'm sorry. So Louise, Louise, thank you, Louise, for playing your dual role. Um, John Edgerton and then um, Elizabeth Kidd, is that you? Do you have a couple slides? Elizabeth Kidd with the Community Foundation of Holland Zealand uh, was uh, hoping to get here to join us and share a few slides on uh, their work. So why don't you get that ready? But let's do John Edgerton, is John here? Okay, please John. And Rich Fink, will you please stand by and um, be prepared to share. Thank you. My name is John Edgerton. I work uh, down a small rural school south of here. Uh, my early background in education was I quit college and I started working in the alternative school movement. And uh, back before it was recognized by public education, but where people were deeply entrenched in the community and serving kids' needs that weren't being met. Um, also have done long-term work and uh, working with men that were batters and helping them try to change their lives. In the last 17 years, I've um, done a lot of roles in the small uh, community school in which I work in. And tonight, I guess I wanted to speak about um, just briefly about immeasurables and intangibles. I fear in education that we've decided that we, through uh, research and cult of the fact, that we can uh, create highly educated human beings. But if I look at my teachers, uh, men like Miles Horton and Paolo Freire and John Dewey, who we never talk about in education anymore, or Parker Palmer, who talks about the courage to teach and the hard work that good teachers always put into their lives, I think we're losing a lot. I fear that no child left behind has become all children left on their behinds. And I think this is a tragedy. What I want to suggest is that what I see in the hearts of my students is a deep longing for social justice, 
for social change that matters, as much as my generation, I feel, partly was driven by that. This is what relevance is about, and I think education is about, to develop true citizens of democracy that so love justice that whatever profession they choose, a doctor, a lawyer, a farmer, a woodworker, that they understand that they are intricately connected to their fellow citizens. I want to just say one other thing. Last Thursday, I came into Grand Rapids to CA Frost Environmental School here in Grand Rapids to a music presentation done by the, one, the first through, uh, or kindergarten through the fourth graders. Say Frost is an environmental school. The last song that these young children sang was, We Are Stewards. And you could feel the passion and the love in their voices about wanting to be stewards of the earth. My sadness and despair at the moment is, I don't think we're being good stewards of our children when we've forgotten that, that understanding that we all are connected to this earth, the trees and the birds, the water, the food, everything is connected for us. And when we've lost teaching kids about that and getting them engaged with that, there is no computer, no technology that's going to substitute for that. They can work together with that process, but they can't substitute for it. I've said enough. I hope that we will think about ways to engage kids in social justice work because that's the place where their passion really lies. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a. John? Yes. I just want to ask By all means. Great. Um, there's a conference, No Child Left Indoors, that uh, next month, I think, that gathers similar perspectives. If you're those interested, it might be a, a useful way to share information about how to teach the stuff we're demanding in the context of getting kids out in the world. So um, let's see. Elizabeth, help me out here. Elizabeth Kidd with the Community Foundation of uh, Holland and Zealand came over to try to share some of the work they're doing about improving uh, college attainment and access, so thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing. And um, I'm going to be joined, if she'd like, by Monique Powell, who's the director of our um, local college access network, Destination Education. So I know earlier you heard from um, Marissa and Brian from Muskegon, and this is a related initiative also um, connected with the Michigan College Access Network. And um, we are based out of the Holland Zealand area, so a little bit southwest of here. And uh, much like them, we are working towards increasing not just access to post-secondary education, but attainment um, and actual degree completion of some credential beyond high school. Okay, I, one thing I wanted to share a little bit about is the planning process that went into this because it was not just educators or the community foundation saying we need to think about college access in our community. It was very much a um, diverse range of stakeholders that came around the table for sometimes different reasons and said that we think that increasing college access in the Holland Zealand area is important. And um, we had over 40 stakeholders participate in an almost year-long planning process where they did a number of things, including um, conducting focus groups with local students and parents to get their input. They also surveyed current providers of different types of college access services in our community, got their input on what they were doing, and also what they saw as service gaps and areas that the demand for their services um, exceeded their ability to supply it. Um, we also reviewed uh, best practice models for places around the country, really, that have been doing this work su successfully and getting results. And we selected two of those that our group looked, in, looked at very in-depth and learned a lot from. And based on this information, this group of 40 stakeholders, which really included 
K-12 educators, higher education, community organizations, business leaders, local government, um, they all came together, reviewed all this information, and um, developed a one-year implementation plan that they were all ready and willing to endorse as something that the Holland Zealand area needed to embrace. Just a few quick highlights about the implementation plan. Um, the mission that everybody eventually settled on, this was a year-long discussion, you can imagine <laughs> the back and forth that went on, but the goal of destination education is to make completion of a post-secondary education an achievable reality for every student in the Holland Zealand area, particularly among our low-income, first-generation, and highest-needs students. And we broke down our work into three, three um, areas of the year that we were hoping to accomplish different things in. And we had a number of different areas that we had defined goals in that the community came up with. And those included the organization itself, governance, community, community awareness and outreach, program delivery and evaluation. And the model that was developed for the organization, and I apologize, the text is a little bit small, but the Community Foundation has served as the convener for this effort but not the primary driver of the content. We've brought folks together on this issue, but really our advisory board, which is made up of 12 different community leaders from different sectors, has really been providing the leadership and guidance on moving this forward. And underneath them, we have our destination education director, Monique Powell, who's with us today. She really oversees the day-to-day -day implementation of this work. She also does her work with a youth board, which is made up of local high school students as representative as we can be, especially of those high needs populations, so that we are constantly reflecting what are our students actually experiencing day to day and are we being responsive to that and working with the partners that we can to make a difference there. Um, we also have um, some other tasks for supporting that, but really along with Monique, we have the two key things are we have ambassadors at a lot of our local organizations who serve as a key point person to talk about college access in a number of different settings as well as um, we've been very fortunate to have two National Advising Corps members who have been placed in two of our local high schools that have the greatest need, who in complement to the counseling staffs there are providing um, really being a resource for college advising, doing a lot of the one-on-one -on -one work that as our counselors have really been strained with their caseload, they don't have the time to provide that level of one-on-one um, -on -one service with students and parents. So we're very excited about that. And we've been um, delighted to have both our schools and organizations that are already working with nonprofit or with our students that may be nonprofits or other community organizations, but also a lot of our local businesses, they've come to see this not just as a social issue, but as an um, economic development issue, and they want to partner with us as well, which we, of course, are very happy about. And we see them, along as being partners in the economic development piece of this, also a great way to access parents, because we have a lot of our parents, particularly of the students we most hope to reach who are working in manufacturing settings and a lot of our big employers. And we hope if we can partner with the employers that that might be a good way to, um, to connect and reach those parents when they might not be able to access us through more conventional venues. And finally, just to wrap up, um, a few of the key things that we are focusing on in terms of providing programming, and these are things that we saw both through the best practices and the local feedback, um, are early awareness activities for middle school students, financial aid advising and awareness, career exploration, group mentoring, and supporting that transition from high school to college. And we are in the pilot stage of programs at this point over the summer and hope to have a set that have been tested and we've gotten good feedback from students and parents to really roll out more fully in the fall. So that's a, just a very quick snapshot of what we've been doing. Um, we're really excited about the opportunities that have been available in collaboration with a lot of the different communities around the state that are looking at this issue and um, have really benefited from what we've all been learning in our own communities and the opportunity to share those things and receive some technical support through the Michigan College Access Network. So thanks very much. Thank you for the work you're doing over there. Excuse me. Whoa. Um, Rich Fink, is Rich here? And Kathleen Lazo, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Um, I'm an early childhood educator. I um, have my master's in early childhood education, and I have been teaching early childhood for 37 years. I guess the first thing I'd like to address is this whole piece of kindergarten being required as a full-day program across the state and funding being based on that. 
And I guess I would hope that the state board and our governor and legislators would understand that because the half-day kindergarten has been a model that has been used and accepted for years, many of the districts across the state do not have the space to be able to accomplish all-day, everyday kindergarten. I know in my, in my own district, um, I'm from Jenison, um, we're going to be looking at having to find places in the district or adding on to buildings or something in order to accommodate the all-day, everyday model. So the cost of implementing that program is going to be great, as well as the cost of hiring the additional teachers that are going to be required to make that program work. While I don't disagree, I feel it's an excellent program. I feel it has a lot of merit, a lot of value for our students. I think you have to take a good, close look at the fact that this has been an accepted model for many, many years, and most districts have built their elementary schools based on that model, and the rooms and the accommodations that have been made for a kindergarten have typically been one kindergarten room that is large enough to accommodate the materials for that classroom. And to find another classroom to accommodate a full day, everyday kindergarten is going to be very difficult and very costly. Secondly, just looking at early childhood education, I would ask the board as you continue to look at curriculum, you continue to look at the MEEP, that you take more consideration into what is developmentally appropriate for children ages 0 to 7 or 8. What I'm finding over my many years of teaching is that our curriculum has moved from what we taught in kindergarten 10 years ago is now being taught in preschools to 3-year-olds. I'm finding that discipline is becoming a greater issue in the lower elementary grades. And I think it's directly related to the fact that many of those children are not developmentally ready to handle the kind of rigor, if that's what we want to call it, in the curriculum. They are just not there yet. And so many of the skills that we teach at the early elementary level are skills that are developmental. When you teach kindergarten, you see when those students are ready. They know the alphabet. They have all of the skills that are necessary that are going to make them successful readers. But not every child reads at the same time of the year, and not every child is ready to read in kindergarten. But yet, that has become a standard and an expectation based on the curriculum that is being handed to us from the state and from the national government. It is becoming very, very difficult for us to try and expect five, six, seven, eight-year-old students to sit for 30 to 45 minutes for lessons that are being required by the state and national government in order for our students to meet the requirements necessary for them to pass the MEEP test in third grade. Looking at the MEEP, I find it very disheartening to know that as a teacher, I can never know what it is that my students are going to be tested on. Every year the tests change. Every year the test questions change. Every year the vocabulary changes. Every year the expectations are changed. I think if we're going to have a moving target, then maybe we need to know what's on that target so that we can actually begin to teach our children the skills necessary to be successful. Because what I find is that the minute they become successful at something, the state deems it necessary to change the test or to make it more difficult so that more students can fail again. And I, I find that very disheartening, very disconcerting. And it's very difficult as a teacher to know that from this point forward, I'm going to be evaluated on, graded on, and possibly paid on how my students succeed in my classroom. And if I'm not allowed as an educator to know what I'm going to be tested on, what my students are going to be tested on, what those expectations are, I find it very disheartening to know that my pay is going to be based on my student achievement. Secondly, going forward with this whole merit pay issue, I take a number of students because I am male, I tend to get those students that are a little more rambunctious and that typically maybe aren't the best learners. And I think if I'm going to be looking at merit and if my test scores in my classroom are going to be the basis for my pay, 
that maybe I'm not going to want to take those students anymore. Maybe I'm going to want to take those students that are the highest performing so that I'm going to be able to get the same raise that the other people get. I think the one thing that we need to understand is that in education, we're not making ice cream. If the company is making blueberry ice cream and they get in a shipment of blueberries and two or three cases are spoiled, they dump them. Unfortunately, as an educator, I'm given my 30 students every single year, and I'm asked to make sure that every single one of those students meets their full potential. And I feel that in my 37 years of teaching, I have done that. And to now look at merit, evaluation, the chance of tenure being changed, all of those things, I feel that I'm not being rewarded as a teacher, and I'm not going to be able to do the things that I'm asked to perform. I can't dump the students that are struggling. I spend more time with them. And unfortunately, the budget cuts that are being made currently, most of the extra help that I have in my classroom, in my building, and in my district is going to be lost because we can no longer afford it. I think the State Board of Education needs to take a very close look at what is developmentally appropriate take a look at Piaget and what he determined many, many years ago that a few times I've been told as well he's dead, what does it matter? But truly does matter in the lives of our children. They are children. They still require time to play. They still require time to experiment and work with hands-on materials. They still require art. They still require all of those extra fun things that we used to do that because of the academia, academia that is now required in my classroom, I no longer have the time to give them. And I guess I ask you in closing, are we going to ask our second graders, our first graders, our kindergartners when they leave school, what do you remember most? And I really wonder if they're going to tell us, I remember that Dibbles test, I remember that NWEA test, I remember all the tests that we took and all the interventions that I've had as a student. When are we going to let children be children, give them a curriculum that is developmentally appropriate, and allow them to learn at a pace that is going to let them be successful? Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you for sharing. Um, Kathleen Lazo and Deborah Kamet. Also, as anyone who has come in, please make sure we get a public comment form so we can I'll call on you soon. Thank you, Kathleen. Hello. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm a new teacher in Grand Rapids Public Schools, and yes, I'm still speaking in front of you. Brave, huh? Okay. Um, my biggest concern is for the urban schools. In 2006, when I did my master's degree in education, I found out, to my surprise at the time, that Title I money didn't go to urban schools, that many of the suburbial schools got it, and some of them for things like swimming pools. Now I'm teaching in urban schools, and I see the desperate need for my students, the money that's been bribed them over the years. I grew up in the South with people who still believed, unfortunately, separate but equal. I disagreed with them then, and I disagree now. We've changed it a little bit, but not very much. Many of our minority and poverty students live in urban areas and in a higher concentration than the suburbial schools. Yet we do not get a higher percentage of the Title I monies. In addition, we get less regular monies than suburbia schools. Not just in Grand Rapids, but throughout an entire nation. Urban schools are being robbed. We need to stand up and say, no, this is not right, and we need to correct it. Not just that my grandparents didn't do it right, that was bad of them. We need to take proactive action to make a correction.
My mother was illiterate, and she couldn't help me learn to read. My brother had to help me with assignments when he could. Students in poverty with parents who cannot read need more assistance and more money, not less. I propose the following things to correct this problem. First of all, that we get the same amount of money as Forest Hills. Whether that's lessening their money and greatering theirs or whatever, but all districts in Michigan get the same amount of money from the state, the initial funds, not the city funds. I understand there's two different amounts. And then Title I money should be given to schools with higher percentage of poverty in the school, not based on who writes the best grants, because who can afford the best grant writers, the people with the most money? Thirdly, when you advise a penalty to a school, and inner city schools will always have more penalties because their children are still behind. You don't take it out of the student budget. Instead, it's a penalty to the person who created the crime, or the, the not crime, what's um, a better term for that, noncompliance. If that's the superintendent, let it go to the superintendent. If it's truly a teacher, let a teacher be fined. But I don't assign myself 100 students. I don't have control of that. And it is a student to teacher ratio that affects the growth in the learning in Grand Rapids Public Schools and also in other urban areas. OK, that was my first issue. How many more minutes do I have? OK, my other issues are much smaller. Now I'll try to protect the teachers a little bit. The merit pay issue. Te pay <laughs> Post tests are not data driven. For data driven education, you need pre test, post test. This is a huge misjustice that is being done. If I had pre test, post test, I could show that my students made achievement during the year. And even urban school teachers would have a fair shot at being paid for what they're actually doing. They might actually get paid more. Then, this is something, I think that education, we certainly have stronger goals now than ever before. We're certainly expecting children to learn more than ever before. And I'm not against those standards. I applied those standards. I think they're wonderful. But what we're not considering is what is social promotion at the same time done with their students. Students also need to be held accountable, and so do their, stu their teachers. And there should be not necessarily failing at every grade, but certain places. We know that students, if they are not caught up in reading by third grade, they will have essentially a learning disability for the rest of their lives. If they can't read at third grade, flunk them, give them a year of reading. We know that at age 10, they start to use logic. If they're not at math and science level at age 10, let's give an intensive year before, while the brain is still open to that learning. Let's not wait until we're fighting our overgrown brains and I'm teaching 19-year-olds sixth grade math. Thank you. Thank you for coming forward and sharing. Um, is De Deborah Kamet and Sandy Pohl? 
Deborah, are you with, uh, I had your colleague, Kimberly Kilby, might be here. Is she here? Okay. I tried to introduce you earlier because I understood you had some forms that you wanted help with. So take a moment and, and explain uh, what well, your work is. I don't is. have any forms. Okay. I just wanted to explain um, what Thank our you. work is and what we're doing here. Um, my name is Deborah Comet, and I'm with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. And we are currently um, in Grand Rapids. We're looking at the issue of how the uh, Grand Rapids Public Schools provides uh, AP and other higher level learning opportunities um, uh, to African American and other students. And um, this is just part of uh, the w type of work we do. We, you know, periodically do compliance reviews of schools. Uh, there's been no complaint filed. Um, so uh, we are just, you know, looking, you know, to see how the schools handle this issue. Um, we wanted to let it be known that we are interested um, in hearing from uh, parents or students uh, in the Grand Rapids Public Schools uh, if they want to share their experiences with us as re in regards to um, uh, AP and higher level learning opportunities in the schools. And uh, we'll be here for a while. If anybody wants to stop by and talk to us, we'll be happy to listen to them. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy Pohl and David Coffey after Sandy. David's still here. Um, I'm Sandy Pohl. I just wanted to make uh, two points. Um, the person that came up and spoke about uh, vocational education, uh, I really think that the focus and support on college prep is great. Uh, the person that's going to be doing brain surgery on you, you want them to have be top-notch college prepared students. But I also think that uh, your point about relevance, uh, we need to strengthen vocational education and the skilled trades because you also want the person that's welding the bridge that you're crossing over. Uh, I think that is a very important thing. I ha had. Uh, I'm aware of a student who uh, was not interested in math, but he became the top welder at the intermediate school district. And then he became very interested in learning how to measure. So that relevance is, I'm glad you're focusing on relevance. Also, teacher training. Uh, years ago, there was a program called the Teacher Corps. It may or may not still exist, but um, I think that training program could be tweaked um, to take teachers uh, that program put uh, prospective teachers in the classroom for two solid years while they took their coursework and other uh, community service but uh, the coursework and the being in the classroom you could put them under experienced teachers who have good results with the AYP um, that would, you know, I, I think that maybe we do need to train teachers differently. I mean, the uh, teacher car program in the past put teachers in areas maybe that weren't the most desirable, but I mean, why not take the teachers that, uh, that maybe you think would be deserving of merit pay or whatever, the, the top-notch teachers, everybody could agree, the parents, the administration, the other teachers could agree that maybe those people should train people in their classrooms. They could be in the classrooms along with their coursework. And that's, you know, that's something I think you could look at that and focusing a little on the skilled trades. Thank you very much. David Coffey, and while David's coming up, um, Brian Barber, after David. Are there any more? Thank you. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is David Coffey. I hold a joint appointment at Grand Valley State University between uh, the College of Liberal Arts and Science and the College of Education. And on the heels of what we just heard, I'd like to, um, to echo those statements that considering ways that we might improve uh, teacher preparation. Uh, first, though, I'd like to, with all due respect, uh, address this idea of shared sacrifice. I'm a little concerned that um, we have failed to recognize the sacrifices that teachers have been making for years. Uh, sacrifices in pay, sacrifices in effort, and also the sacrifices that the kids of Michigan have been 
put through for years. And so this idea of more shared sacrifice, I think we've got to be careful with that. Uh, as opposed to that, what I would like to suggest is thinking about partnerships. Um, at this point, it really does feel like we've got crumbs that we're throwing out. And even as you've heard some of these um, people speak so passionately already, fighting over those crumbs, as opposed to thinking about how can we take these resources that we have available and creating partnerships. <clears throat> Excuse me, one of the ideas that I would like to, to suggest would be a win-win-win situation. Um, like I said, I, I work with pre-service teachers. We've been talking about relevance. My teachers would benefit from the relevance of actually working with students in real classrooms. Too much of what happens in schools of ed nowadays are um, at the very least theoretical. And being able to be have real access to real kids um, to do assessment, to do evaluation, to do um, uh, instruction would be a benefit as soon as possible. Um, unfortunately, that's difficult for a lot of teachers um, and districts who are feeling so stressed out with tests. They don't want more people in their classrooms. They don't want more, you know, expectations and more support. You know, they don't recognize it as support. They recognize it as a burden. What I'd like to suggest is if we could do this so that it would be a support. Teachers are overworked. I work with lots of teachers and the fact when I come in to ask them about what they want to work on, their, their initial uh, comment to me is, Dave, I'm sorry I should be doing more. What we need to do is figure out ways to support them. If I, I have a class of 60 this coming fall of uh, pre-service teachers, what if those pre-service teachers could work within the area schools to be able to support those teachers. We, we heard um, Dr. Smith talk about diagnosis. We, we've heard several people talk about the need for support in, in instruction. What if we were to put into place where 60 of my students could go out and support those teachers? It also would benefit teachers from a standpoint of having to share their own thoughts and thinking with pre-service teachers, you know, that the value of coaching has been shown. And, and again, unfortunately, with the funding the way it is, one of the first things that school districts have to cut is uh, instructional coaching. That doesn't just benefit those uh, teachers that they're coaching, it also benefits the coach themselves. And this gives all teachers an opportunity to share and to, to have to be thoughtful about what they're doing. And then finally, we've talked a lot about relationships. This sort of approach would provide one more adult in a child's life uh, who cares about that child's success. And that's been proven to, to make a difference in, in all academic literacy, all areas of, of learning. And so I would really like to suggest that, um, that we could think about doing this differently. I also, though, recognize that, that this isn't going to work across the state. I'm from the UP originally, and, and you know that's a little bit different than I can find places for 60 students, 60 of my students in Grand Rapids area, but it would be much more difficult if I was at Northern or if I was at Lake State or if I was Michigan Tech. And so I think the other thing that we have to look at is the use of technology. The use of technology to, for instance, have two of my students Skype in with two students in Indian River. Okay, that could give, provide su support. We need to think about not just resources, but we also need to think about availability. There are school districts that um, have put handcuffs on the technology, especially Wi-Fi and, and the Internet, and we need to figure out ways to be able to make that more available so that we can uh, create a more uh, uh, world, uh, worldwide community and um, again just this idea of being able to build uh, relationships. I apologize for not having anything completely written out but you've got my uh, information and you can con contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much David. Perfect. Brian Barber. And, uh, Good evening. Um, thank you uh, for <laughs> it's a great thing. America's a great country. Just thinking, you know, what a great country, great state. We get to go through all this thing through difficult times, and, uh, and uh, I think we're going to come out stronger as a result. So thanks for taking my comments. My name is Brian Barber. I'm the director of White Lake Area Community Education. It's a five-district community education consortium which serves the northern part of Muskegon County, in particular the districts of Reese Puffer, Whitehall, Holton, North Muskegon, and Montague. Lord forbid I forget one of those. Um, 
And uh, also, I came here actually to support Marissa and uh, Elizabeth and our local college access network initiatives throughout the state of Michigan. Um, as we continue to, to look at this whole idea of P20, there's just a couple of thoughts that I've had, and I've studied preschool through 20, and 20 to me is PhD. I know there's some, maybe a little bit of ambivalence about what the 20 means, um, um, and the P, but for me, uh, it's preschool through PhD. Um, just a couple of, of thoughts that I might offer. Um, we run, uh, again, um, programs in those five districts, which include preschool, um, all, all sections of Head Start, GSRP, and um, tuition preschools, so roughly 26 sections throughout the five districts. Um, and then in addition to that, at the other end, um, we were one of the pioneers and still are one of the pioneers when it comes to local college access networks. It seems to me that our current system has two dating issues. Uh, one being that our success is predicated on our, our date of manufacture, our date of birth. Um, and then as, as a result, there's a, a date of expiration uh, that we've kind of put on ourselves as a result when we get to say 18 or 19 when it comes to high school. And I've heard a lot of our colleagues talk about tonight the whole idea of having a, a more fluid system wherein essentially we have a lot of social promotion that goes on. And I see those uh, students in my adult education program. Again, I, I serve the, the gamut. So I'd, I'd, I'd challenge us to again think about this whole notion of data manufacture and, and date of expiration based upon maybe a four or five year gra uh, cohort graduation issue. The second thing that I think is really important as we move forward again in this P20 discussion is for us to take a look at curricular congruence. We've had a lot of discussion when it comes to Glicks and Huskies, um, grade level content expectations, high school con contact level expectations, um, so uh, K through 12. But yet, I don't, I don't know of any discussions that have taken place grades 12 to 13. And that's essentially what we do. We go from, if we want, if we want to have this, the system that's seamless, we roll on into 13th grade and 14th grade and so on. So it's just a challenge, a quick, a quick thought. Um, and um, thank you for the time. Thank you. So I've got um, Lynn Heemstra and then Douglas Juan. And then uh, if there's anyone else who'd like to speak, please um, make sure we have your name and information. And I think, uh, I know I'm eager to have um, my colleagues, Kathy Strauss and Marianne, and I at the end here make a few reflections on what we've heard this evening. It's invaluable for you to be willing to take the time to share with us and help us be as helpful as we can in the shared enterprise of trying to improve our education and create opportunity for all our kids. So if you're, I appreciate your sticking with us this afternoon and welcome a um, chance to say a few words of reflection at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words um, before you and I really appreciate the, that you're taking the time to come to our communities to, to hear what we have to say. I'm Lynn Heemstra, and I'm from Our Community's Children, which is a partnership of the City of Grand Rapids and the Grand Rapids Public Schools. I've been in that position for 12 years, and my office advocates for the needs of children in the community. A large part of what I do is to ensure, um, is to facilitate community collaboratives, and one of those is the Expanded Learning Opportunity Network, which is a network of over 40 organizations that have dedicated themselves to ensure that children have access to quality after school programs. And I raise this to your attention because after school programs stand as a committed partner with education to ensure our children are on track to be ready for college, work, and life. And there are quite a bit of resources coming into the state of Michigan currently. And those resources are dedicated to provide extended learning that looks and feels different for young people from the school day. Uh, however, we stand committed as along with education to do a number of things that, that um, I'd like you to be aware of. One is that we are working to align our efforts to ensure that what children are getting in after school programs 
um, reinforces what they're learning during the school day, and that we're building on reading and literacy, and we're building on ways that uh, young people can learn how to go to the, how to go to college and how to explore careers that they might be interested in. Second of all, we're dedicated to quality practices, and we know that we need to have good teacher, worker, child relationships, and that we need to ensure that there's good attendance. And we know that if we do that, kids are more likely to attend school on a regular basis. Thirdly, we are dedicated to a data monitoring system that tracks our outcomes related to child academic behavior, juvenile offenses, as well as social behaviors. So there's quite a bit of alignment, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, we really do stand committed to promoting the Common Core Standards that, and the goals that the school board has in place and that together we can work very strongly in leveraging many dollars coming into the state as well as partnerships for the best interests of our children. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Douglas Wan, is Douglas still with us? Well, thank you, Douglas. Still with us, You're, you joined us not that long ago, but thank you for coming. I also appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here. I thank you for being here. Uh, Douglas Hahn, H-A-A-N. Sorry, Douglas. That's okay. I've been, I've been called worse. Um, I teach in Rockford Public Schools, which is North Grand Rapids, and I'm also the president of our Teachers Association. So. I've had a, a bit of a challenge to decide kind of where I wanted to go and what I wanted to say because I'm representing uh, the same group but two different groups. And I, <clears throat> I know who my teachers would want me to represent and it would be the kids. So what I really would like to address, um, this is my 33rd year of teaching. My first 18 were, was here in Grand Rapids. Um, great 18 years. Uh, I, this is uh, my 15th year with Rockford, and I've been a special ed teacher during that whole career. In very, uh, various areas. One of the things that has been very, very difficult for me, as well as the special ed students that I work with, is finding a good reason to help them understand why some of them are being asked to do things that the federal government has said you're not necessarily able to do. So basically what I'm saying is um, I have a student right now that has taken the ACT three times because he wants to go to college. And bless his heart, he's, he's gained uh, a point each time. And I'll tell you, for a high school student to have the courage to attack that device three times, um, is, is just unbelievable. Um, I don't know that I could do that. But when, when we needed to start implementing the, the Michigan Merit curriculum and all of the expectations that go along with it, the services that we were delivering at the time, while I believe we were meeting the needs of the student, I believe we were preparing them better than we are now to face post-secondary education or jobs or whatever it is they choose to do, what career they might choose to go into. I think we've taken a lot away from them. One thing that I think we've taken away from is their opportunity to be involved in vocational programs. 
I have the privilege when, uh, Thursday night of giving five scholarships, $750 each, to five of our, of our deserving students. And as president of the association, I get to do that, and, I, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it, it's becoming more difficult, though, because as I see what's happening to education and I see the challenges that they're going to face that I am not going to have to face because I'm not going to have to do this for another 20 or 30 years. Um, that's tough for me to deal with as well. But back to, the, back to the students, we've had to move from uh, more of the resource room style instruction to especially at the secondary level, 912, to try and tr we, we do the very best we can to help these students attain the skills that they need to take the MME and the ACT, which means that for some of them, they're not going to have the opportunity to take advantage of vocational programs that they would typically do at the high school level. It was, we have one of the best, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best vocational programs with KCTC in the state. Um, I worked on the same campus in another program. I'm very familiar with the program. My son also uh, chose to attend KCTC during high school, the auto body program. I have students who would like to do so, but they can't because of the struggles that they're having meeting the objectives that they need to for, for their testing and evaluations. I think it's really unfair to them. I think it's unfair to me because I don't feel that I'm really, I'm really servicing these students the way I could be, the way I should be. Um, one of the reasons I brought up the awards, we have for years, we have said that we want, of the five awards we give, we want at least two of them to go to a student that has expressed a desire to go on with further vocational training. We don't have any this year. We had one last year. We don't have the students able to take advantage of those programs during high school so they don't pursue it after high school. So anything, I guess anything we can do to help our students who fall into that situation deal and cope with the, with the rigor that they are expected to, to do is I think it's just our duty to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any others of you who would like to speak in front of everybody? We, I'm sure, will linger for a few minutes and talk informally for those who want to uh, attack us in private. Sir, you want to? Can you introduce yourself? Please, it just helps us to uh, introduce yourself and...
Thank you. You name a number of important topics, and it's very important for us all to hear uh, what you think. I think the bus schedule, we just need some good math teachers who can run some simultaneous equations to figure out how you can pick up the, uh, the elementary school students and the high school students and use one team of buses. Some districts have figured that one out. That may be the easier of the, the topics that you name, but thank you very much. Are there others who want to um, say something? Yes, please introduce yourself and come forward. Thank you. Mary Jo Chisholm from Rockford, thanks. Um, um, I'll thank the guy from Rockford for, for giving me the courage to speak. My name is Mary Jo Chisholm, and I have two children in the school. One of them, Bright, the other one struggles, has struggled since the first grade. And I have done everything in my power to help her with her ability. I have privately tutored her since the time she was in first grade. So my struggle is she's approaching high school and she has this Michigan merit curriculum that faces us and her and I both are nervous. She struggles in intro to algebra. Next year we have take algebra, after that geometry, then algebra two. How are we gonna do this? I don't know. So that's my big concern is that they're trying to fit everyone into a cookie cutter here and not every child has the ability to, to fit that mold. And yeah, my goal for her is to be in college someday, but maybe it's gonna be occupational. Maybe she's gonna do culinary, but we gotta graduate her through high school. So that is the crux of my conversation for today. Um, and, and the other thing that I struggle with is the fact that we're cutting, 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 that these kids need more help in high school. They're going through ninth and 12th grade, you're putting all these requirements on them, and they're getting less and less academic support. So these are my concerns for today, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to, and having the courage to share. That's, that's why we're here, is to provide an opportunity for us to hear, importantly, from you and all the folks that we uh, heard from today. Kathy, do you have some reflections on what we've heard today? And then Mary Ann, and then yeah. we'll wrap up. First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here, and so many of you have been here the whole time, so that's really terrific, and I really appreciated hearing what you had to say. I agreed with a lot of what was said. I agreed that you spoke about financial literacy. I've been to a lot of jumpstart meetings, and I, I feel very strongly about that, that we should be doing more. We managed to get it in, but not, of course. So. I think you have to keep plugging away, and uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, I, as I said before, I think the emphasis on relationships and, and relevance is absolutely critical, and I've been pushing that for a long time, too. Not always successfully, but I, there are a lot of these things that we've been pushing for a long time that takes a long time to get the ship changed around. Um, and I, I really appreciate hearing from the teachers. I love the teacher who talked about kids want, want to promote social justice. That's really encouraging, and, and I hope we can encourage more teachers to do that. And I think a lot of you have raised the issue of whether the curriculum is too set and not enough time for these other things to get into the curriculum. And that's something I think, uh, we specifically said that these are not core, the, the credits are not courses necessarily. The kids can, can, and we're stuck with a lot of tests, whether we want them or not. The federal government wants them, and legislature wants them, governors want them, everybody wants tests. And so, the, and we know that kids have to know a lot more today in order to get a decent job than was necessary. 10, 20 years ago. Uh, everybody, I think everybody knows it, but a lot of people can't, haven't gotten quite used to the idea, and they don't accept it. But the kids do have to learn a lot more in order to get a decent job. There's no question about it. But there should be room in the curriculum, and there should be room for teachers to be creative 
and I, I don't want to see that creativity taken away from teachers, because I think that's what makes good teachers. And it's, it's very important, I see Lupe sitting here listening to this all day, and for the state board, too bad she didn't win. But <laughs> uh, there might be some of her supporters here, I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, I, I think it's important that teachers feel and do remain creative. Don't be so bogged down by what, what, the, what we say is the merit curriculum, because you can use the merit curriculum to teach in many different ways. Use your own creativity and imagination and resources to bring in things that we might not have thought of. Uh, so feel free to do that, I think. And uh, I'm very glad to have Lynn Heemster talk about the uh, after school programs and the great partnership you have here in Grand Rapids. So there are a lot of good things, but we, I'm really delighted to hear what you have to say, and we will take all of this back to our colleagues and our superintendent and staff so that we can learn from what you say and act on it. So thank you very much for being here and thank you for your contributions today. Thank you, Kathy. Marianne? Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I said in the beginning, thank you all for uh, coming today. But, um, Many of you came up here and thanked us. I think it was a little backwards. We are are just thrilled that you came. We're thrilled to hear from you. Um, we offer this time to speak out at our uh, board meetings, but we understand people don't always have the wherewithal to be able to come that far to our meetings. I think we should be doing more of this, coming out and, uh, and hearing from you. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, I wanted to also say uh, many of you have given me something more to think about vis-a-vis um, -vis some of the programs we've, uh, we've instituted at, uh, at the state level. And um, I'm, I, I hope we can move along on, on some of that, particularly the um, early childhood and kindergarten situation. And um, we don't always stop and think about capacity and um, what's going on with all of that. Uh, the after school programs, the jump start, we, we do hear, but it, it has it takes a whole different meaning when we're hearing it in your land. Actually, it's my land too. I grew up here. So thank you again, and um, stay in touch. And we hope we can uh, work out this uh, the high school situation. There are um, avenues open where students can take. Um, um, a course uh, geared particularly to them, and you might want to investigate with the district um, about that possibility. It's, um, um, it's helped a lot of students in other districts, but it's not widely known that it's available. So thank you again, and uh, hope we can See you again soon. We'll do more of these. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, Marianne and Kathleen, for joining me and coming over here. This is, this is our job. I mean, we work for you. And we are going to do more of these um, sessions where we can learn a little bit more, learn a little bit more profoundly by making it accessible and easier what kind of um, innovations and activity where we can do things that we saw some glimmers of today to help you with your wonderful projects and programs and initiatives to improve learning. Um, we can hear things that we aren't hearing at our meetings and that we need to hear. We can, I mean, we, we work real hard and I'll, I'll speak on behalf of all of our colleagues. We wanna make good decisions 
on behalf of you all about education policy. We want to be vigorous advocates for what is in the best interests of our young people. Uh, but we need to know uh, when things we think are good ideas and have uh, adopted important changing policies for our schools, are they working? Are they not working? Are there unintended consequences? I mean, to echo Kathy's uh, point, you know, the, uh, setting high expectations in the key competencies that we need all young people to learn is, it, it is right and needed. Um, but it is clear that you know, some of the things we heard today reminds me we're, we're, we're push, we can't have pushing here to have the math and other competencies if it's at the expense of um, vocational and career context. We've got to do better to animate the vision and the reality of what we have passed in Michigan, particularly the high school standards. As Kathy said, we don't care if you teach it upside down, sideways, you know, in the gymnasium, in the lab, in the repair shop. Uh, we need to make it come alive by having it in real world applied context. We haven't figured out how to be as supportive in bringing this mastery of content into the real world context with the kind of relationship. So it just reminds us how far we have to go. Um, I think we, we really appreciate hearing things that we need to uh, do more of, things that we need to pay more attention to, uh, things again, as I said, that we uh, just haven't thought about hard enough. So I really wanna join my colleagues in saying thank you to you all. We, we work for you and we want to play our role as helpfully as possible and effectively as possible. And we are in this together and appreciate your taking the time. As Marianne said, uh, this, is, this is a street that is, you know, no need to thank us. This is what we signed up to try to be helpful. But thank you for taking the time to try to share your perspective experience and your good ideas of how we can work together to improve education. And I really appreciate your, your coming out and uh, we look forward to working with you. And please communicate freely. You will, uh, we will respond, we will engage, uh, we'll do our best. Uh, we can't always say yes, we can't always say no, but we can try to move the, the ball down the court. So appreciate your help. Thank you.